the uh, uh, men's javelin as well will be taking place the field events in the middle first uh, track event of the night is the women's 800 meters the t54 round one we've got the men's long jump final for uh, partially sighted athletes and the men's 400 meters t46 round one so lots and lots of uh, events tonight just waiting for the entrance of uh, the athletes So this is my third event of the day. This morning I was commentating on the sitting volleyball, which was fantastic. And I went to watch uh, the blind five-a-side football. And now it's the athletics. So the first event of the night that we're going to see is the women's discus throw, the F57-58 final. First to throw will be Madinat Abdulayva of Azerbaijan and Orla Barry of Ireland. The announcer just introducing the women's discus throws to the crowd. You can see there in the crowd quite clearly the little electronic pads with nine LED lights on each pad and they are something you'll have seen at the opening ceremony and the closing ceremony of the Olympics and the opening ceremony of the Paralympics it's used to great extent by the creative director of the ceremonies to uh, send all sorts of images whooshing around the stadium. Lovely aerial shot. quite clearly see there the four different throwing arenas the shot put and the discus and this all used to be wasteland it's all been reclaimed and rebuilt for the Olympics this used to be a very deprived part of London they look like they've made their own flag So wherever you're watching in the world, you can follow us on Twitter, at Paralympic is our address, at Paralympic. And uh, if you want to watch different sports on the web, we're paralympic.org, and there's live streams of various other sports, uh, wheelchair basketball, sitting volleyball, powerlifting. And you can like the Paralympic movement on Facebook at our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash Paralympic Games. Last night we were trying to get it up to 100,000 likes. We went easily from 98,000 up to 100,000. Actually, during God Save the Queen, we got our 100,000th like. And our last time I looked, we were up to about 110,000, which is fantastic. So thanks to everyone that's been liking the Paralympics on Facebook. There's the Paralympic flame burning proudly in the corner of the stadium. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, the victory ceremony for the men's shot put F57-58. So we're going to start tonight with uh, the, the victory ceremony. The medals will be presented by Baroness Sue Gardner, member of the House of Lords, who is accompanied by Sir Ian Johnston, Director of Security for LOCOM. Ladies and gentlemen, the bronze medalist representing South Africa, Michael Lawrence.
bronze for South Africa. heard him say thank you very much I appreciate it ladies and gentlemen the silver medalist representing Poland Janusz Rakitski silver for Poland Representing the Russian Federation, Alexei Ashapatov. Alexei there in the famous Russian tracksuit. Big hit at the games. So the first anthem we will hear this evening. First medal ceremony will be the Russian anthem, one of my favourites. It's a good tune. Sing along if you know the words. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, as is customary, will those who are able please stand for the national anthem of the Russian Federation. Victory ceremony there for the men's shot put. Gold for Russia, silver for Poland, bronze for South Africa. So do check out our Facebook page for Paralympic Games. There's a lovely picture of Prince Harry with uh, Maddie, who's the youngest member of the Aussie Paralympic team, and she's got a gold, a silver, and a bronze in London this far. Prince Harry wearing a T-shirt and jeans. Still waiting for the action to get underway. Women's discus is taking place. We're not actually getting pictures of that, but I can tell you what's going on. Abdullah or Azerbaijan. Let's throw it.
thrown 17-67, and all of Barry of Ireland has thrown 28-12. Hopefully we will be seeing some pictures of that shortly. Ladies and gentlemen, the victory ceremony for the men's javelin F-52-53. The medals will be presented by Baroness Sue Garden, member of the House of Lords, who is accompanied by Sir Ian Johnson, Director of Security, Local. Ladies and gentlemen, the bronze medals representing Mexico, Maro Maximo de Jesus. Bronze for Mexico. Silver for Iran. Jamaica, Alfonso Cunningham. Let me tell you that Madina Abdulayeva of Azerbaijan set a season best for Herself in the discus, 19-21 with her third throw. We'll bring you some discus action, but we're just uh, seeing the medal ceremony at the moment. We're about to hear the Jamaican anthem. Now the silver and bronze medalist will join the gold medalist on the platform for the photo. Alfonso Cunningham getting the gold. Silver 
for Iran, bronze for Mexico. The traditional holding your medals up picture. And that event was for the seated javelin throw. Oh, he's dropped his flowers. He's got them. So there we are, we're seeing the first throw there for Orla Barry, 22 years old from Ireland. And this is the women's discus throw. As you can see, it's a seated throw. And that little whoosh will just tell you that this is a recording for her first throw, 28-12, which is worth 921 points. Now, the reason we have a point system is because the uh, final is for F57 and F58 categories. They're both uh, seated discus, but with uh, different levels of impairment. So there's a scoring system, which is quite complicated. But fortunately, you don't need to worry about that. It's just the number of points, and Orla scores 921 for that. So we've got the athletics now, the men's 1,500 metres. And if you're with us uh, the other night, El Amin Chentouf of Morocco is going to be the man to watch. He was uh, phenomenal the other evening. Henry Kerber of Kenya, he'll be one to look out for as well. The British crowd will go mad for David Devine. The form athletes would be El Amin Chentouf, who's run 3.52.77 this year, and uh, David Kaur of Kenya, who's run 3.52.96. Both of those are about three seconds faster than everybody else. There's David Kaur of Kenya. And there's David Devine of Great Britain. So this is the start of the men's 1500 metres, the T13 final. There's the starting gun. And they're away. Three and three quarter laps at the track. And it's career of Kenya, one of the fancied runners, straight into the lead. And he's being tracked by El Amin Chentouf who's now in third place from Morocco, the one with the glasses. And we don't like to dwell on people's impairments when we're covering the Paralympic Games, but we get lots of messages on Facebook and Twitter saying, can you just tell us exactly the different classifications? So this is T13. T just means it's a track event. If it begins with an F, it means it's a field event, some kind of throwing or jumping. T is the track event. And then if it starts with a 1, it means they have a visual impairment. And so uh, T11 would be blind, T12 would be partially sighted, and T13 would be uh, the least impaired of all of the visual impairments. So these, these guys would have some sight, but not great sight. But we saw El Amin Chentouf the other night absolutely storming away with the 5,000. So it's the Kenyan in the lead at the moment. Career of Kenya, 
Chen Tu for Morocco, and these are the two we did pick out. And the, the Brits hanging in there as well in uh, fourth place, David Devine. And Zhu of Tunisia, who we saw again the other night, looking very good, the other athlete at the moment. So they're the, I would say it's the three to watch, and the, the Brits there being roared on by the home crowd as well. But I would, he's a, his personal best is about three seconds behind the others, so I expect he won't be able to live with this pace. Now, Chen Tuf is a runner who likes to run from the front, and he'll be looking to get past Korea of Kenya, but Korea, the Kenyan at the moment, is not letting him past. You can see Chen Tuf again tries to go past and Korea once again puts his foot down on the gas it's very fast at the moment world record for this event is held by Tim Prendergast 351 82 and the Paralympic record is actually held by David Korea of Kenya 352 96 was uh, actually set in the qualifying for this. So it's the Kenyan in the lead, the Moroccan just on his shoulder, career of Kenya, Chen Tuf of Morocco. And the noise tells you that the Brit is coming to the front, David Devine comes to the front, they take the bell, one lap to go. The Brit leads, but again the Kenyan comes back, Chen Tuf of Morocco is falling back. It looks like he's, uh, his race is over. He's fallen right back. It's uh, the world, the, the Paralympic record holder, David Career, in the lead. David Devine of Great Britain in second place. And Zhu of Tunisia. It's Career, then Zhu, then Devine. It looks like Career's getting away. David Career, the Paralympic record holder from Kenya, but he hasn't yet shaken off Zhu of Tunisia. It looks like Great Britain are going to get the bronze, but who's going to get the gold? Will it be the Kenyan? Here comes the Tunisian. Zhu of Tunisia comes flying past. He saved himself to the end. Zhu of Tunisia gets the gold. It's silver for Career of Kenya and a great bronze for David Devine of Great Britain. Well, Chen Tuf of Morocco was one of the fancied runners, but he fell out with about 400 metres to go. It was between Career of Kenya and Zhu of Tunisia. And the smart money would have been on the Kenyan, but uh, Zhu of Tunisia just tracked him and tracked him and came past him just on this final bend. At this point, you'd have said Career of Kenya, the Paralympic record holder, would be favourite but he, he's showing the strain and just look at the ease with which the Tunisian accelerates and comes past him. Great running. And that's a terrific gold medal for Zhu of Tunisia. And he's delighted with that. So gold for Tunisia, silver for Kenya, bronze for Great Britain. So as the Tunisian goes round on his lap of honour, let's just have a quick look at some of your Twitter messages. Anrika Pinar says, in awe of all the athletes being watching every day, moved to tears each time, athletes putting abled bodied to shame. Lee Frawley, uh, so proud to be at the Paralympics, but sad the journey has to end and life go back to normal. Making plans though, thanks London 2012. And I hope people across the world watching the Paralympics in London will come and visit our beautiful city. You'll be made very welcome. Can't promise it'll be as warm as it has been uh, during the Games. 24 degrees in the stadium tonight. Beautiful day. I was out this afternoon watching the blind footballers in the five-a-side. Great Britain were playing Iran. It's a great privilege for me to sit with Sir Trevor Brooking. Uh, who's a hero of mine, played football for my uh, childhood team, West Ham United, who I still support, and uh, 
He's now director of football for England. He was sat watching the uh, five-a-side football for blind competitors. Good to see Sir Trevor enjoying himself in East London again. So the women's discus carrying on. We'll bring you pictures of that as and when we can. And we've got the men's uh, shot put final as well. Starting but the first track event of the night, the men's 1500 metres, the T13 final. Let's bring you confirmation that Zoo of Tunisia won uh, with a new world record of 348.31. David Career of Kenya also set a world record in second place. And you're thinking to yourself now, how can the guy come second have set a world record as well? Well, it's because he's in a different class. There's uh, T12s and T13s. It's a different level of uh, disability. So the T12 would uh, have more problems with sight. And uh, even though he actually was the faster runner. So 348.31, a career of Kenya set the T13 world record of 348.84. And David Devine of Great Britain sets uh, a regional record with the time of 349.79, just 20 years of age. He's got a great future ahead of him. So this is something we recorded for you during that race. You can hear the bell being run in the race. That's how we know these pictures aren't live. It's the men's shot put. Daniel West of Great Britain, 34 years of age. And the seated shot put. The catch-up is F34, once again F meaning field, and 34 for the level of disability. His personal best is, well, he's just set it, 11.37. And that is a Paralympic record. And so you don't need me to tell you that that puts him in the lead. In the F34 final of the men's shot put, 11.37 for Daniel West of Great Britain. And that is a Paralympic record, but there's some uh, very good throwers to go. Sibon of France has a, a personal best of 12.22, although he's only thrown 11.38 this season. And if you're wondering how the Frenchman could have thrown further, but that was a Paralympic record. A Paralympic record is just when it's set at a Paralympic Games. World records can be set at any time, but Paralympic record just at the Games. So next up is the men's 100 metres, the T12 final. Again, this is for athletes with impaired vision. World record is held by Muradov of Azerbaijan. The time of 10.66 and the Paralympic Games record by Adazoji of Nigeria, set back in uh, 2004 with the time of 10.75. So lane two, we've got Rodriguez of Spain, Shrikalich of Russia in three, Yansong of China in five, and Mikalski of Poland in seven fastest season's best is Mikalski of Poland with 10.85 and then Trikolic of Russia with 10.91 so you'd expect it to be between the Pole and the Russian and the Chinese probably coming third and the Spanish runner just 24 years of age has the slowest season's time but anything can happen in 100 metres. There's Lee of China. So the starter just calling them to the marks. And he'll ask for the stadium to go quiet for the start. The 
cries of shh around the stadium. So we're looking for Mikalski of Poland and Trikalic of Russia to be fighting this one out. It's the men's 100 meters T12 final. Live from London 2012. And off they go away. And it's Trikalic and Mikalski. Trikalic of Russia. Trikalic of Russia in the lead. Lee of China coming back. And it's a late challenge from Mikalski of Poland. But the Russian's going to get it. The Russian got it. Trikalic of Russia takes the gold medal in the men's 100 meters T12 final. And he's off. Usually the sprinters don't like to do it too far, but he set a new personal best, 10.81, Fedor Trikalic of Russia. He's won the gold medal, points up to the sky. And I don't think he can quite believe it. Let's watch this again. He was easily the best out of the blocks. Chinaman had a good start as well. Lagging a little bit on the near side was the pole, but then the Russian came through midway through the race, head perfectly still, dipped for the line, and it's gold for Russia. Silver to Poland, it looks like from that. Yes, confirmed as Poland, 10.88. It uh, doesn't matter how far you put your head, it's the, they measure your chest, whose chest crosses the line, and the China, Chinese athlete was just overtaken by the pole, and Lee of China sets a new regional record of 10.91 to get the bronze and as expected Rodriguez of Spain with the, a slower PB getting fourth place 11.20 so there's confirmation gold for Russia silver for Poland bronze for China So a new personal best for Trikalic of Russia to win the men's 100 metres final. And it's the start of the men's long jump now, the F20 final. And it's the Russian to start. 22 years of age, he's got a PB of 6.50. And that looks a little bit short of that, maybe 6.20 or something like that. So, a great privilege to welcome my co-commentator tonight, Katrina Webb, legendary Australian Paralympian. How are you, Katrina? I'm really good, Jeremy. Great to be back with you uh, at Paralympic Sport TV. It's uh, exciting to once again see the sport that I spent a lot of my career in as we watch the men's long jump. And just remind people... Uh, who you are and what, you, what you've done. What, what was your sport? My sport was athletics. I specialised in 100, 200 and 400 and did dab a little bit in long jump, but not as good as uh, what we see here. And I went to the Atlanta, Sydney and Athens Paralympic Games and managed to win three gold, three silver and a bronze over my career. Uh, so this is my first games as a spectator and uh, absolutely loving what I'm seeing. It's, but I think it's easier, isn't it, as a spectator? Oh, so much easier. Yeah. I'm drinking what I'm like, I'm eating <laughs> what I like, I'm getting about five hours of sleep every night. So the complete opposite from being an athlete. But uh, And you've got a role as an ambassador, haven't you? Here? Yeah. So what, I, what does that actually I'm, mean? I'm an International Paralympic Committee ambassador, um, which is an absolute privilege and an honour, and uh, I'd like to thank the IPC for that. Uh, my job is varied. I, I spent today with the CEO of Allianz, global CEO of Allianz, um, Mr. 
Dr. Michael Dickman and uh, with his wife, we spent the morning at the athletics and then had lunch with Sir Philip Craven. So uh, it's been fabulous to uh, to meet the sponsors of, of the Paralympic movement. And For to anyone that was with us on the other night, was, was it um, Saturday night? when I was working with Katrina for the first time, everyone that came on in a medal ceremony, Katrina had had lunch with or yeah, dinner that's with. that's right. She's a great socialite. <laughs> that's right. Well, Michael Dickman, the, uh, the CEO of Allianz, did present a medal this morning. You probably did saw he? him. So um, he was here for today and uh, fabulous job. It's uh, being emceeing different functions. I'm working at the Paralympic Ball tomorrow night. I've got a stint on stage interviewing some athletes. So it's a whole variety of different um, functions and, and commentating like we are tonight. So... I'm loving every minute of it. So we've got the uh, men's 1500 metres, the T20 final. Let me just get the runners and riders up in this one. We just saw Steve Morris of Great Britain, 23-year-old, being introduced to the crowd. And just looking down at the times here, Steve Morris is in with a shout because he's got the, uh, the fastest season's best of 3.58.93. So this is the uh, T20 final. And once they're underway, I'll get Katrina to explain what that means, <laughs> T20. And they're off. And they're off. So T20 is the intellectually disabled class and uh, we see them come back in the games since being actually prohibited from the games since the Sydney games where the uh, Spanish basketball team actually had a few members of the team that didn't have a disability. Uh, so INIS, who are the International Federation for International Intellectual Disability, have come up with a, 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 a stronger, more bulletproof classification system so it's fantastic to see this class back in the games. So it's the Ukrainian, Galini, who's gone out in the lead. And uh, the Ukrainian, Viktor Sherbina, in second place at the moment. I, I wonder if the Ukrainian's gone out a little bit too fast, Galini. He's, uh, I wouldn't ahead. underestimate the Ukrainians. I know <laughs> the powerhouse of what they do in their country. And uh, let's see uh, if I know the strength of their programs. Let's hope that he does lead the race and hold it. Because the others aren't really catching his draft. No, not at all. <laughs> They're not benefiting from that at all. No, but he's not getting any further away. Is he? He's just uh, keeping the same distance ahead, which uh, sometimes means they get, they get caught. But we'll see. He looks very focused, concentrating. So it's uh, three and three-quarter laps of the track. And we'll wait and see how he gets on. Will the pack haul him back? Or is he up and out on his own? and get away Andrei Golini of Ukraine he doesn't have the fastest season's best um, Steve Morris from Great Britain looks like he has the fastest season's best but that doesn't matter it's up to what's happened over the last few months the last uh, maybe 6 to 12 months to see who's really got that best preparation and program in place for the most important race tonight's 1500 metre final. Yep, Steve Morris is uh, on paper three seconds faster than the Ukrainian, Galini. And they are gradually beginning to wind him back in. Good lap time there of 67 seconds. It's uh, for, for people viewing, if you don't know that pace, go out and try and run a 67 400 metres and uh, you, I doubt it whether you'll be able to achieve that. Banzanjani of Iran leading uh, the chasing pack and you'll hear a roar now because the Brits just going up on the outside that is Steve Morris run a 2-3-1-9 keep an eye on the red and yellow also China is such a strong program so Galini of Ukraine in the lead at the moment Banzanjani getting the bell of Iran it's a lap to go and this is where we'll see some moves being taken. The Russian on the outside. Always a very strong program. Krishtalev of Russia going up now. And they've caught him. So it's uh, Banzanjani of uh, Iran and Krishtalev of Russia. 
And it's hard to pick a winner from this. It certainly is. The Brit looks like he's struggling a bit. He can't get round there. Both Polish runners are running very strongly. And Galini at the opening, the, the guy who led a lot of the way, is coming back. But it's Banzanjani of Iran. And now the second Russian has come into play. Looks like Pick. Uh, and that's uh, Kork of uh, Poland is coming up. But it's Banzanjani's going to get it for Iran. Banzanjani gets it for Iran. And what a fantastic race he's run. And he's celebrating a fine victory there, followed by the two Polish runners. Peck and Cork. Peck and Cork. Right. Hmm. And I think it, Cork was, looked like he got it, but then Peck got it. We so might have to wait for the official times there. I think Cork was pecked at the line. <laughs> or was Peck corked, corked at the line? I don't know. <laughs> but I know that Banzanjani of uh, Iran has won it. And then the two poles fought it out for silver and bronze. But there we are, the winner of the men's 1500 metres confirmed as uh, Banzanjani. Peck has been confirmed as the silver medalist and bronze goes to Cork. Two poles there. And look at him sprinting away, that last 100 metres. As he came out of the bend, he looked around, he saw where he was and he just said, hey, boys, I'm going to give it to you. And sprinting through, a fabulous finish. He knew he'd won it, crossing the line with a decent time. He had the time, 3.58.49. Just a second out of his personal best. Yeah, it's a season's best for him. Uh, Peck of Poland with a personal best. Uh, Cork of Poland with a personal best and Galini who was the runner that went out on his own to start with he also set a personal best so fantastic quality in that race Khrushchev of Russia in fifth Morris of Great Britain in sixth uh, he 402.50 so he was over three seconds outside his PB he'll be disappointed with that Ukraine getting seven Spain getting eight uh, Martinez Morot getting a personal best season's best for Kimura of Japan in ninth and a high quality race that one that's right and as you can see it really at the the distances over 800 meters really doesn't matter about the time it's about tactically who crosses that line at the finish to get the gold and Bazajani very happy with that result as you would be just a reminder we've got the field events going on the women's discus the men's shot put and also the men's long jump and we will be going back to that looks like this oh is uh, this is going to be the men's long jump Zoran Talic. So this uh, is the F20, which is the field equivalent of the category we've just seen. Yeah, exactly right. So again, the intellectually disabled class. So you w obviously won't see a physical disability, but with athletes having an intellectual disability it can have an impact quite a lot on their physical preparation depending on their level of uh, cognition and memory um, and he's just set a world record <laughs> on his first jump first jump uh, seven meters I, I said world record but i have a feeling that actually that's a paralympic record you're right it, because his pb is 712 so it can't be a world record but uh, yes it's actually come up differently now on the, on the system as a Paralympic Games record, not a world record. Now that's my first view of the stadium tonight, Jeremy. Mm. It looks like it's sold out once again. Yes. I can't see one spare white seat anywhere there. That's because the camera's too far away. <laughs> if they zoomed in, we could see them. They'll oh, look, it wouldn't surprise me if there was there will always be s There'll always be someone who's got held up at work or stuck on a train well just like me mm. so uh, I was a little bit late coming in tonight there is a lot of traffic uh, heading out um, after our commitments today but it's wonderful to finally be back here and be watching the athletics program at the London 2012 Paralympic Games how much sleep are you getting because you seem to be doing something all the time not too much about I think I'm averaging about six hours uh, but that's okay. It's only for this two-week two period and... That's all Margaret Thatcher ever had. <laughs> yeah. That was her big thing. She didn't need any sleep. <laughs> and you remind me very much of her, Katrina. <laughs> well, I did uh, manage to close my eyes for about 10 minutes on uh, m when I was moving today. And I think sometimes if you can do that, grab a quick power nap, you can keep going. Yeah, I'm all for power naps. I might have one in a couple of minutes, actually, <laughs> now that you're here to take over. So it's the women's 1500 metres T12. 
Now let's see how I'm getting on with my classifications. T12, I think, will be for uh, partially sighted runners. Very good job. T11 would be for blind runners and T13 would be partially sighted but with better vision. That's right. But we do have a combination of both in this race. Uh, we've got T11s and T12. So you'll probably see with the guide runners there being with the T11 athletes. The T12 athletes are the ones probably that don't have a guide. Um, it makes it very difficult for me when they have the guides to pick out who the people are <laughs> because uh, you're looking for the numbers and then suddenly there's all these people in the orange fluorescent bibs. There's Elena Pautova of Russia, season's best of 4.39.83, which uh, is the fastest so far, so she'll be one of the favourites. The way the, the camera works, this, it, they tend to pick out the, the better runners or, or the local favourites or the famous runners. I think it's a shame, actually. I was in the stadium the other day and I thought that they should all be introduced to the crowd. And um, I was watching a, a 100 metres race and, it was, and there yes. were eight people and they pick out three. Yes. And you think, well, I think well, everyone deserves to be picked out. But that's this just has me. changed because this happened for every one of my events. It went through the order and everyone mm. would be announced. So um, I agree with you. I think it doesn't take too much to give people that <coughs> honour of making it to the start line. Absolutely. And they're off. And, uh, as, you know, if you're not going to win then you don't get called out. And I think that's a, sh a shame. Mm. You were lucky because you probably would have got <laughs> picked out anyway because you kept winning gold. Yeah. Well, look at that. Gone into formation straight away. Um, one of my interesting comments of the games is I haven't yet seen one female guide runner. And I'm having a bit of discussion with a few friends around this of mm. where are all the female athletes that maybe have uh, in the midst of their career or but we see plenty of male guide runners and that's a wonderful thing but if you were a, a partially sighted runner you would want the best guide and the best guide would be a man wouldn't it do you think <laughs> yeah be well because men are stronger and faster aren't they so well well true um but over certain distances i think still female female guide runners can be helpful i was talking to a friend of mine who is a guide runner the other day and um you only need to be about half a second better than your athlete over 100 metres, mm. maybe a second over 400. So uh, depending on the classification, I think there would be some very good women runners out there that could do the same thing. Not mm. to say the men aren't doing a great job, but uh, just a general observation. I think you're trying to take away our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Coming over here, having, our, having all these free lunches, <laughs> taking away the men's jobs. So uh, it's Elena Congost of Spain comfortably... Uh, in the lead there, 24 years of age, Tweed 12 uh, runner, and uh, actually she's in second now, Elena Patova of Russia in the lead. So it's the two Elenas, Patova of Russia from Kongost of Spain, and uh, the Russian has the fastest season's best by three seconds. So uh, as they're both called Elena, I'm going to call them the Russian and the Spaniard. <laughs> And uh, if you know your flags, you'll know it's the Russian ahead. Red and yellow of Spain in second place. Yeah, setting very good pace there. Here come our T11 athletes, and uh, you can see their guides speaking to them, particularly when they come out of, of the bends. And the, the bends are more the harder parts to run, so they'll be now telling them as we go around the corner, OK, we're just heading out of the straight, getting into the bend to just change their technique to come out. Um, but obviously, as a longer distance event, the guides are probably more there as a support. When we talk about the sprinting, every step is crucial uh, with athletes to make sure right from their blocks, they're out in the same rhythm. Now I'm going to say something very obvious because I think it's something that viewers across the world will all be thinking. The, the two at the front have an enormous advantage because they've got better sight. They haven't got the guide runners. Why, why haven't they got their own final? Well, that's a good point, and you see this in the games, um, depending on how many athletes we have in these classes. Mm. So often, if there's if not a strong depth of athletes, we, we might not even be able to have an event. So when we look at this event, we've got uh, probably more T11 runners, um, and when we combine it, we can have a stronger field and make sure there isn't... Better than not having an event at all, they'll do the combination. Absolutely, here. yeah. I, I, I just suppose yeah, people good, looking at that will think, well, there's two that haven't got yes. guide runners and they're the lead two, yes. and then all the others are, are a long way back. Yes. And of course, you know, you can't go as fast if you can't see. But anyway, it's uh, Paltova and Kongos, the Russian and the Spaniard, and the Russian Elena Paltova puts her head down now, and I think she's going to try and sprint away. Can the Spanish girl catch her? The Russian's 26, the Spaniard's 24. 
the Russians PB is about three seconds faster and I think this is going to be gold for Russia yeah she's really taking it away on the back straight fantastic technique we see the Spaniard just starting to slow down a little bit but the Russian is really stepping it up coming into the last 200 meters where she'll really work off of this bend keep the momentum going to come home with whatever she's got left in the tank and hopefully cross that line first to take out the gold medal of the women's 1500 212. Minetti of Italy is the fastest of the runners with guide runners but the Russian really putting her head down now now the world record uh, 419 20 not in any danger at all but uh, her personal best is 436 38 so she might just get that 436 I think she'll be just outside it yeah just outside her uh, personal best but it's a season's best for Elena Pautova of Russia Elena Kongost of Spain 24 years of age will get the silver and uh, it was Manetti of Italy coming in for the bronze but she may well have been overtaken it's hard to see so oh what no oh what a shame the guide runner lost his athlete oh now she's fallen down oh that's a oh terrible no. terrible shame you heard the cast right round the stadium get up and finish you get a big cheer I'm just not quite sure what happened there because when the camera picked it up mm. he was away from his athlete so he's obviously gone to it's Fuiza of Portugal and she'll get a big cheer from the crowd oh what a shame the cameras come away just as she was getting across the line because nice to see her finish yeah she seemed to have to be a long way ahead of her guide runner somehow and then he was racing to catch up with her that's right and then he sort of tried to say I'm behind you and and, and actually pushed her and she fell over but uh, the Russian has won the gold she's saying where's my flag <laughs> she is. Spanish girl's got silver <laughs> she's got a flag where's my flag there's one I love that give me a flag there you go Hooray. from the Russian team off she goes Cut. still looking like she could do another 1500 meter final yeah it's fantastically high tuned athlete look at that physique beautiful six pack strong arms she's obviously trained for a very long time it's not actually physically possible to do a lap of honor without a flag you have to have a flag <laughs> it's, it's the law it's the Paralympic <laughs> law if you if you do a lap of honor without your flag they take your medal away it's, <laughs> it's in the rule books it, not many people know about it but yeah you do have to have a flag for the lap of honor and she's to feel like you're a superwoman I think that's it like yeah, a cape like, like a I've just won I'm the best in the world and look at me I can fly it's a cape flying out behind well done to Alina Petova from Russia now last night I was uh, doing the athletics we were off probably at some meal or something and we were trying to get people to like the Facebook group for Paralympic Games to get it over 100,000 oh, I've seen it. it's over 100,000 it during God Save the Queen oh. last night it went over 100,000 very fitting and it was 115,000 the last time I saw there's the Portuguese athlete who finished I do hope they're not disqualifying her that would be just rotten well we'll wait and see what happens there well, it hasn't come up yet, but uh, Pautova of Russia gets the gold with 437.65. Kongost of Spain, silver. And Minetti of Italy did get third place, and she set a world record in her class, which is T11 for uh, runners with guide runners. And uh, yeah, Maria Fuiza of Portugal uh, in ninth place, and she has got a time, so that's not a disqualification. There's confirmation of the men's 1500, the T20 with Bazanjani of uh, Iran, ahead of Peck of Poland and Cork of Poland. And there's just the other five placings of the men's 1500 meter T20 final. Jeremy, well done. Over 100,000, incredible effort. Yes, it is. I'll have a look now and see how many we've got. You carry on talking and oh. I'll find 112,000. 112,000 people. And I must say, I did receive some beautiful personal emails from people watching. Lovely. Um, just to say, thanks, well done, we're enjoying listening to you. So if you want to send us any messages or got anything you want us to discuss, we would be more than happy to do that when we get a break in the program as we go to the men's T20 long jump. Fantastic jump there. That looked very good. Portuguese athlete. 
And he's cheering, he knows he's done a good jump. Let's just see that again. Great technique, really got on the board there, over seven metres. Flying through the air. Good slide out to the side to clear himself and uh, he's wrapped. Let's see what his result is. I think he can't believe. 6.59. 6.95 metres with a lovely tailwind. And there's the results, as we've talked about, from the women's 1,500 metre T12 final. The Portuguese didn't get disqualified, but the Mexican athletes have been DQ'd. Oh, OK. However, the two Alinas from Russia and Spain taking out the, the gold and silver, followed by the Italian Minetti taking the bronze. Great stuff. So the, we'll keep you up to date with what's happening in those field events. Next, it's the men's 200 metres T34 category. Um, on the track. Let me test out your classification knowledge, T34. T34, uh, well, it would be a leg disability. But then there's a kind of... Because they're in a chair. They're in chairs, <laughs> so I've got a bit of a visual clue a there. Three is cerebral palsy. That's always the one to remember. It's oh. my classification. Uh, T means just track. Three is cerebral palsy. And then the last number will be the lower it is, the more disabled they are. The higher it is, uh, the least disabled. So... 34s, uh, you'll see, tend to, to be in chairs just generally. They might, they might be able to walk around with uh, crutches, but just so much easier to be in a chair. Absolutely. Uh, Let's have a look at the competitors then. Stefan Rusch of the Netherlands qualified in the time of 30.57, which is his season's best. Big cheer for the next one. Jamie Carter of Great Britain. Uh, I'm sure there's a big roar. There, through from the stadium. Just 17 years of age, Jamie is. 30.85, his uh, best. There's Mohammed Hamidi, the man in black, the United Arab Emirates. Swiss competitor, Bojan Mitic. And here's the Aussie, Reid McCracken. What a great name. It is. <laughs> it's a cracking name, <laughs> isn't it? Blimey, <laughs> mate, it's Reid McCracken. <laughs> That's right. One of our young athletes. And, uh, he sounds like someone out of Crocodile Dundee, Reid right, McCracken. That's right. And uh, there's Walid Katilla. Sorry to do a comedy Australian voice <laughs> on you there. From Tunisia. <laughs> I'll just take over now. Austin Pruitt from the USA. And Sebastian Mober of France. Look at, he's in the zone, isn't he? Look at that. He's in the Controlling zone. his breathing with 29.42 uh, as his season's best. And I think when we look at the season's best, we're looking at 27.98 from Katila, Katila in lane seven. Absolutely, 27 years of age. This is the final of yeah. the men's 200 metres T34 classification. <coughs> so Katila of Tunisia, and you could see how quickly he's away there in lane seven, and he's uh, in the, with the red cap facing backwards. Katila of Tunisia absolutely flying at the moment. Uh, Reid McCracken inside is going very well and so in black is Mohamed Amadi. It's Mohamed Amadi chasing down Katila but Katila's going to get it. It's Katila from Hamadi from McCracken. Katila's going to get it. The Tunisian crosses the line. Walid Katila. It's uh, silver for Mohamed Hamadi of the United Arab Emirates and Reid McCracken gets a bronze for Australia. And a fantastic time there. Uh, a world record or equal world record are we looking at 27.98 time I can hear the Spanish caller next to me I think he's saying that is a world record there 27.98 superb race from the Tunisian Katila I should point out we're in a commentary booth and there's a Spanish guy <laughs> next door and even though you'd think the booths would be soundproof, every now and again we hear Paralympico Recordio Mondiali. He gets very excited and keeps the energy flowing. And on the English commentary, we're just very cool there. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I think he's won a world record. Well he done, that man. He certainly has. And look at that fabulous technique. Yeah. Cartilla, wonderful. He's got a cap on backwards. You don't actually... I don't think I've ever seen... I thought that was a bandana as we were watching, but he's wearing a cap backwards. He's wearing the reverse baseball cap, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen somebody wearing a reverse cap at a Paralympic record. Have you, Jeremy? 
I think it's a new record for someone <laughs> wearing a baseball <laughs> cap <laughs> backwards. And maybe this is what you need to do to break world records. Well, certainly if you had a baseball cap on, that's the way round you'd want to wear yes, it because the you'd get the drag from the peak, wouldn't you? That's right. So he certainly thought it through. <laughs> but why would you? Why would you go for a baseball cap? Is it because he's down with the kids? I don't know. Is he, uh, but something's working for him. Catilla well. world record 27.98. He will be wrapped with that result. Wind conditions reasonable, pretty still, as you can see, with a 0.4 headwind, not too much to worry about. But uh, Mohammed Hamadi in silver and Reid McCracken, my fellow, fellow Aussie, coming in third. And I think he'll be quite happy with that. He's one of our young athletes, and uh, to go home with a bronze medal, what a great result for him. So this is Azadi Nouri of Morocco in the shot put as you can see it's the seated shot leans back oh it's a great noise I, th I hope he gets a good throw from that because that noise was worth it Nuri in 13.10 uh, metres. Men's shot port final. And it looks like that may have been a new world record. Gee, it's uh, hot in there, the stadium tonight. Two world records in the last couple of minutes. That's the Russian in the long jump. And that's uh, not quite seven metres. So Azadi Nuri of Morocco, we saw there, setting a world record. He's uh, leading at the moment, you won't be surprised to hear, seeing as he's just set a world record. Ahead of uh, Elmin of Russia in second place, who has jumped 12.76. And in third, it's Kaidi of Iran. So trying to keep you up to date with all the different events. Let me just give you what's happening in the long jump as well. There we see the Russian, he's just jumped 6.59. But it's uh, Pinheiro of Spain who leads the long jump at the moment with uh, 7.25, a Paralympic record. Uh, Talic of Croatia is second, Ladies just behind him with girls, seven metres. we have the victory ceremony for the men's 1,500 metres, T13. So this was uh, a race we saw earlier. Have you had lunch with that man? I had breakfast with him this morning. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mr. Bob, Bob, yeah, Bob Bob, he's a board member of the International Paralympic Committee. He has his three children here, triplets. Okay. And, uh, and they usually come in threes, don't they, triplets? That's the thing. <laughs> three children, triplets. Yeah. Well, that's right, they could have been. They might have not been triplets, but what an amazing experience for his kids Great and wife Britain, to be here David and see Devine. their dad out there presenting a medal, the medals tonight. And there's David Devine of Great Britain, very popular winner of the bronze from the fee 1500 metres. What a divine moment for him, hey? <laughs> a roar from the stadium. I'm glad they leave these uh, victory ceremonies for the night time because to be there with this many people in the stadium your you, home the, country. The, uh, the morning sessions are just as packed, but I think there's always more atmosphere under floodlights. Ladies and gentlemen, the silver medalist representing Kenya, David Korea. David well Korea. I haven't seen too, ma too many Kenyans winning medals so far. So good on him. Wonderful performance there. He's the Paralympic Games record holder, but uh, just eclipsed in that race. I did get to hold and uh, touch a gold medal last night which was great the first time I've seen one they're absolutely beautiful and I was told that the front of the medals are the feather from um, the Greek goddess of victory Nike as people would know more so of Nike Nike uh, I wasn't sure what that was so there you go the gold medalist and Paralympic beautiful medals champion representing Tunisia Abderrahim Zhu Zhu of Tunisia with the gold medal. 
Yes, Nike, the, the goddess of victory, which is where the sports company gets its name. Um, He's going to kiss his medal, not bite it, but uh, very happy, as you would be. A wonderful moment in your life that you'll never forget. So you are happy to take questions from people Ladies on Facebook? Of course. As is customary, we'll give you a bit of time then during the Tunisian anthem. Stand. Go to the our Facebook group, Paralympic Tunisia. Games. Any question you want to Katrina about Paralympics. gentlemen, boys and girls, your Paralympic medalists. And as always, the silver and bronze medalist will join the gold medalist on the platform. Kenya, Tunisia and Great Britain. Chris Hockman on Twitter says, wouldn't a backwards cap make you more streamlined like the cycling time trialed helmets would cut out the drag of your hair? I don't think he had any hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a good point. Mm. Um, well done for commenting on that, but I, uh, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting one. I've never seen a, a cap in Paralympic Games, but uh, you could start a new thing, a new trend, and obviously it didn't hold him back, why breaking a world record. Why don't they wear the helmets like the cyclists, then, you know, with the, the long tail behind? Well, the you, you think they should, shouldn't they? The speeds that they get going at and uh, the crashes that we do tend to see, but I suppose over the shorter distance, um, it's less likely to happen. Back to the men's long jump, T20 long jump. If you've just started watching, this class is for the intellectually disabled athletes at the Paralympic Games. And the Spaniard determined he's going to get the crowd going. Exciting for these athletes because they haven't been able to compete in the Paralympic Games since Sydney 2000. This is uh, Exposito Pinheiro, 34-year-old Spaniard. Oh, that's oh. massive. That's massive. That is big. That looks mid sevens. I'm having a guess here. Let's. Uh, well, we saw uh, seven meters dead from uh, Talich, and that he, well, he cleared the seven meter mark. Let's have a close look technique. at this. I hope it's a legal jump. Yes, it was. He did just start. Well, it's well over. He's well over. Uh, it's he's level. Very close to eight. He's level with the sound microphone. <laughs> he's got look at that tape. That tape on his calves. Pink and black go pink faster black. stripes. Yeah, seven twenty-five. And a Paralympic record. So well done, because uh, seven metres from Talich uh, was in the lead. But uh, we have a new leader, the Spaniard, 34 years of age, Jose Antonio Exposito Pinheiro. With 7.25, it's Zoran Talich of Croatia, 22-year-old with uh, seven metres. girls, we have another victory ceremony for you, this time the men's 100 metres T12. Another victory ceremony coming up. So, uh, Chris on Twitter. This evening to be presented I'll tell you what, after Robert the medals, Bob, I'll ask you the question. Governing okay. board member of the International Paralympic Committee, who is accompanied by Mr. Charlie Wijeretna, LOCOG Diversity Board member. It's a really Ladies exciting time for these the uh, VIPs the or they get China, to present the medals. The I know just being with one today, such a fantastic moment for them. Mm -hmm. Of course. And that's why I didn't want to talk all over it with, with this question I'm going to ask you. Uh -huh. It comes in from a former APC staffer. Which 
Chinese competitor getting his bronze. And the flowers. Very successful games from the Chinese. I think a lot of athletes will be sick of seeing the red from the back with China <laughs> written on because uh, they've and had an incredible game so far. Medalist representing Poland, Maciej Michalski. Michalski. Someone in the crowd with a very loud whistle. Okay, I'll ask you this question. Chris Hopman says, how can we get more interest in Paralympic sport for the four years in between each games? Very good question. I think, uh, well, I think after these games, it's going to be different. It's again, taken it to another level and we need to all work in our own countries with our National Paralympic Committees and, and doing what we can to, girls, to get people involved. And Paralympic champion representing the Russian Federation, Fedor Trikolic. Fedor Trikolic. Very distinctive white hair. Yes. And uh, he was a worthy winner of that race. From the second half onwards, he just put his head down and just bombed it over the line. In the the fashion statement of the games, the Russian tracksuit. I'd like one of those, wouldn't you? <laughs> You know, we've got to remember too that the Winter Games are only two years away. Uh, Sochi. So, Sochi, that's right. So Where is Sochi? In Russia. Oh, of course, that's, yeah, why, so that's why he's saying it. Yeah, so, you know, we need to keep remembering that they've got winter, Ladies summer, winter, summer, and, and girls, right on the back of each Games to keep the movement alive. Able, please stand for the national anthem of the Russian Federation. Okay, I'll test your knowledge of the British royal family. Which one of the royals was that? Prince Edward. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I suddenly can't hear you very well. Have you have you pulled your lead out? What's happened there? Can you hear me now? No. <laughs> Hang on, we're just going to uh, switch the sound off for just a moment. We just need to sort out a microphone. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. I'm back. Yep, we can hear you, you're back. Prince Edward. <laughs> that was Prince Edward. I did have lunch with him at the Melbourne Commonwealth Games. Uh, it was my last competition and uh, I was really impressed You've with his Paralympic with knowledge. Edward. I have. And I was with all the Commonwealth Games athletes who were non-disabled. Yeah. And I thought, here we go, we'll get to me. I'm the only athlete with a disability and uh, I'm going to have to s explain everything. But I was so impressed with his Paralympic knowledge mm. that I think he actually knew more about our sport than he did non-disabled so a bit of a fan of Prince Edward from that moment when you said that you're a fan of power I thought you were say you were a fan of his parents <laughs> who are it's of course the Queen and Prince Philip he did he did bring up something interesting he said to me I can't Kenny, believe you've had lunch <laughs> with Prince Edward <laughs> he said to me what do you think in the Commonwealth Games level here not a Paralympic level but when there's a, an athlete with disability event within an, an able-bodied non-disabled event mm. he said what do you think about a handicapped handicapped race mm. 
So actually combining the disabilities when it is a, a part of a non-disabled event and getting them to run off di uh, different handicaps like professional running does, yeah. um, where people run and win you know, different gifts mm. around the world um, and then make it a bit more hyped so it can just be something different at a game. So if anyone wants to comment on that. I like the idea of winning a gift. Winning a gift. And it's wrapped up in wrapping paper. <laughs> what have you won? A sa you actually win a sash, a beautiful sash that goes across your body and uh, big sport in Australia. Quentin Hull says, remember the name Reed McCracken, 15 year old, claims Australia's 10th bronze at the main stadium. Is Reed 15? 15 years of age, yes. Quentin Hull, who's commentating for Australian TV. Is he? Oh, yes. you had lunch with Quentin? I was commentating with him the other day. Okay, <laughs> okay I'm going to switch it. Uh, it was actually me that switched your mic off. That's why we couldn't hear you. I was fed up with you dropping <laughs> names all the time. You're listening to Katrina Webb, socialite and Australian Paralympic legend. She's had lunch with most people you're seeing on your screen tonight. <laughs> and I'm Jeremy Nicholas, just a proud Londoner enjoying the games in my home city. So it's the men's 200 metres, the T11. Keep sending your questions on Twitter and Facebook. Alison Fisher wants to know, is there a specific reason why some of the T20 runners were wearing different coloured shoes? Style? Style. Sponsorship? Just their own choice, yeah. yeah Nothing I don't to think do with no. classifications, was it? No. There's no classification for first runner in pink shoes or blue shoes or anything like that. It's just literally... Look at this final. We've got three Brazilians in this final. I think the Rio games are going to be very exciting with the level of talent I've seen at the London Paralympic Games from the Brazilian team. In lane two, there, Lucas Prado, with his guide, runner, Justino Barboso dos Santos. Very well done. <laughs> Qualifying time of 22.92. Which is his season's best. His PB is 22.85. He's 27 years of age. Daniel Silva, very popular name, Silva in Brazil. And we look how happy he is. Let's see if he'll win the silver or he'll go for gold, hey? Now that would be good, wouldn't it? Silver gets the silver, gold. Silver, silver gets the gold. And this is uh, Armando of Angola yes. with Palanca as his guide. The guide's very excited. The, the guide's, guide's doing a bit of uh, the same bolt moves. The guide's more oh. excited than the runner. And this is uh, Felipe Gomez of Brazil. <laughs> oh, characters here on the start lineup. Which is great. I really like seeing this and I really like what Bolt has done for sprinting and uh, when I see this, because this is a really nervous time when you're standing here about to start your final. Mm. So to just to be able to take that edge off but keep focused, I think you just have to do and then uh, focus straight away. It's okay to acknowledge but then oh, get your are. focus back. The microphone nearly cut out again. It did. There, I'm not going to move again, but... Uh, I'm not sure if it's an intermittent fault or some kind of quality control <laughs> that they... <laughs> someone turns you down. I have to be down. careful of my words, hey? No. Now, just really important, this is the most important part of a race here with the guides, getting them set up perfectly in the blocks. As they come out together, holding on to the... You can see the rope there. They're just uh, positioning together. Their first step out of the blocks is so important to make sure they're in rhythm together. If, if this doesn't happen, you're already from the start, not in a good position. Now I can't cheat in this race and say the Brazilian, the Brazilian, because there's three Brazilians. So it's Gomez outside from Brazil, Armando inside him from Angola, Silva, and then Prado from Brazil on the inside. It's the 200 metres T11 men's final. Perfectly quiet. Gomez gets away well, Silva gets away well as well. It's uh, Silva going very well in the, the second lane. Silva from Brazil ahead of Prado from Brazil on the inside. The Angolan Armando is going very well as well. Silva just in the lead at the moment. He's got competition from the outside from Gomez. It's Silva from Gomez. The two Brazilians ahead. Silva on the inside. But here comes Felipe Gomez. Felipe Gomez. Oh, I think Felipe Gomez I think nearest right. us just got it. He has. I think it was Felipe Gomez, then Daniel Silva, and then probably Armando of Angola and Prado of Brazil, but it was all very, very close. And for a while, uh, Prado has got it, and Silva's got the silver. Silva, I told you Silva would get the silver. <laughs> he did try and get his chest across the line, but uh, Prado was just too good and the finish, taking out that. We're just waiting for the times to, to come up for us so we can see how fast they've run. So Prado, the uh, world record holder with the time of 22.99. His world record's 22.48, but he's delighted with that. Cesar Lopez, his guide, 
congratulates him. In fact, all the Brazilians are getting into a bit of a huddle now. <laughs> and uh, Silva gets the silver. Daniel Silva with a time of 22.99. Uh, Gomez equaling his uh, PB, 22.97. And Armando of Angola, 23.10. And Prado, uh, 23.15. Look at that, 0.02 of a second difference between gold and silver. And this just goes to show you how close the difference can be. What's the difference between silver and gold and uh, 0.02 of a second for how many years of training? And I'm quite pleased that with three Brazilians in the race, I managed to get the first four right. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to give myself uh, a gold, I think, for that. <laughs> so <laughs> Gomez got gold, silver got silver, Armando got bronze. And, and as you can see, the photo finish. Yeah. Oh, and backflip. Very talented. <laughs> that's, a, that's a forward flip. <laughs> Sorry, a forward flip. Yeah. I can tell you, I can tell it's a forward oh. flip because he went forward. I What's this one called? I, well, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, hopefully, he's not going to go too far. He's. Uh, <laughs> that looks like a dad dancing at a wedding. <laughs> that's what he's doing there. <laughs> the dad dancing <laughs> at the wedding dance. Yeah. So Sorry, I'm getting my backflips and forward flips mixed up. No, it's a, I'll tell you how I remember it. If they go <laughs> forwards, it's a forward flip. That's, how, that's just a little technique I use. And if they go backwards, then it's a backward flip. Thank you. It's uh, just a little it's system. a nice little blonde moment for me there. A little system I've, I've come up with. <laughs> um, so it, this does all go quite well for Rio, doesn't it, in 2016. Um, the uh, enthusiasm for the Brazilian competitors. It's going to yes. be a great game. Are you going to go? It yeah, I, I'm just going to say now I'm yeah. going to be there. Don't know what capacity yet, but okay. uh, I will be there in Rio. And over the last week or two, I have been meeting people who are a part of the Rio. They're called Rio uh, 2016 because we were talking about it last night. Rocog just doesn't kind of sound as good as Locog or Socog. So they're actually calling themselves Rio 2016. We that's just explain Locog is London Organising Committee right. of the Olympic Games. Yes. So Rocog would have been... Rio Olympic Rio, Olympic. and that just didn't like it. So their, their title is Rio 2016 or 2016. And uh, there's a lot of people here watching, observing, taking photos, writing notes, working out exactly what happens here at a Games, and they need to replicate this in Rio. You don't get to see another Games. So if you, if you miss photos here or miss mi speaking to the right people, there's no chance to... To see another games in four years. So what I need to the summer games. I anyway. need to start meeting some Rio people and saying, "Can I come and be a commentator at Rio?" Don't I? That's right. I need to throw my cap in the ring. Where is my cap? <laughs> oh, was that your red cap out on the track? Oh, I've uh, got a cap. So here it is. <laughs> here it is. It's down there. There's my cap. Let's throw it in the ring. Well done. It's in. Well, you're doing a fantastic job. Yeah. Jeremy, we're enjoying having you as part of our. What you need to do, Katrina, is games. when you when you go for one of your lunch, one of your power lunches mm. with your, take me along when there's some Rio people there. And uh, say, this is the guy that needs to be your main stadium announcer in Rio uh, de Janeiro. Well, I nearly had an opportunity. Tomorrow night is the Paralympic Ball. It's the first time ever there's going to be a Paralympic Ball. Yeah. A fundraiser. Um, it's at the Grosvenor Hotel and there's uh, about 700 people coming along to raise money for the movement. And I did have a guest ticket. Um, What's it's happened? Been, it's been taken up. Who's so. had that? <laughs> Tomorrow night? Well, I'll be but you're working here. so I'll uh, be working here. You'll be working here, so... Toughest gig, I did quite a lot of after dinner speaking and sort of uh, conference hosting and things. Toughest gig I ever did was at the Grosvenor House Hotel. Um, 700 West Ham United fans the day after we were relegated from the Premier League and I was hosting the main stage trying to cheer everyone up and we'd just been relegated. I've been a West Ham fan all my life so I was absolutely gutted. And I was, and I was doing the auction, you know, to raise money for uh, Bobby Moore Fund, the big charity, the cancer charity that West Ham support. And I tell you what, it was a tough gig when you've just been relegated from the Premier League to try and uh, cheer up all these fans. I can only imagine. In fact, it's, I'm getting shivers now just thinking about it. Fortunately, <laughs> we, we, we have uh, since then had one season in the Championship and now been promoted back to our rightful place in the Premier League. Uh, let's see what's happening in the long jump. Just a reminder, the leader, Pinero of uh, Spain, Talic of Croatia in uh, second place and Cunha of Portugal in third and just when we start talking about the long jump, here comes a long jumper. We can only see him on the screen because the camera's giving us a wide shot. I do apologise for that. There's nothing I can do about that. Oh, there's a Mexican wave on the way. Have you, have, have you been in a Mexican wave yet? I was this morning in a bit of a Mexican wave. Uh, they were starting one up this morning. But you know what? I really like that, you, that the viewers are getting this, this feed. I know it's not as exciting as seeing the athletes, but at least you get to feel 
try and feel what it's like when you do sit in there because when you're sitting in that stadium, mm. you can choose to hone in on one of the events or you can choose just to have this great shot of the whole venue. It is a marvellous venue. Uh, to be honest, though, if there's long jumping going on, I'd like to see the long jumping. <laughs> I do find this a little frustrating when we hear the long jumping. Well, let's have a yes, look at it. Yes, let's have a look at it. Yeah. Now we've lost the feed altogether. Oh, it's, we're back. Men's 1,500 metres. See, if you tell them off, they'll cut the feed <laughs> from you, Jeremy. <laughs> it's a bit scary, wasn't it? You see someone in the uh, broadcast centre somewhere <laughs> who's moaning about the coverage. We'll pull the plug. But it's back. Look, there's a lovely Mexican wave. It, when you do the Mexican wave and you stand up, do you make a noise? Because <laughs> I do. When it, when it goes around, you go, woo, up like yes, that. Yes, I would. And particularly, I'm sure these people in that stadium are tonight. So it's the men's, men's 1,500 yes. metres, T46. T46. What a great name, Chris Hammer for the United States. That's a real Chris superhero Hammer. name, isn't it? T46 is uh, arm amputees. Matthew Silox there from Australia. Here's the lineup for the T46. So just having a look at uh, who's got the, the fastest time. And it's uh, Samir Lua of uh, Algeria, Chris Hammer of the United States, next fastest, and Chesham of Kenya, 23-year-old. Uh, they're all under four minutes with their times. There's the youngest of the field, 19-year-old Matthew Silux from Australia. Been a good game for Australia, hasn't it? It has been, mm. yes. I... Um, and I keep dropping functions, but I did go to an Australian function last night and uh, they're very, very excited with the results that have been achieved so far because our Olympic team took a while to get going. Uh, but our Paralympians are, are doing a great job. So it's the men's 1500 metres, the T46 final for arm amputees. And Chris Hammer of the United States run a 2828 in the red there at the front. A couple of uh, Kenyans tracking him, three Kenyans now. Very strong Kenyan field here. Chesham, Tabe, and Cheriut, Stanley Cheriut. But it's uh, Chris Hammer of the United States who leads them out. And of course, as soon as I say that, he gets overtaken by Chesham <laughs> of Kenya. And it's a Kenyan one-two at the moment. Chesham and Tabe. Kenyans, uh, we said we hadn't seen many of them, and now we've got three in this race. So obviously, in uh, Olympic sports, they dominate the middle distance running, and uh, I think we're gradually beginning to see them taking over in the Paralympics. You're right, and I was just thinking that as you, you just alluded to it. it this is exciting. I, I'm just watching this field going, this is incredible, because we know the Kenyans are wonderful runners. Um, when you think about their background, I know I met one of Kenya's fantastic uh, world record holders, Tegla Larupe, and to get to school in the morning, she has to run 10 kilometres and to get home at night, run 10 kilometres. So if you're sitting there viewing and think, well, how do you get involved in, in running? For these guys to have an education, for some of them, requires running 20 kilometres a day. So you can see why they can lead the packs. And it's really exciting that we're finding uh, athletes with a disability in these countries because they will dominate the events as they should. And this could easily be a one, two, three for Kenya. At the moment, we've got Chesham in the lead then Tabe and Cheriut in the bronze medal position at the moment. And Chris Hammer, who started off so well, has gone right to the back now. I think he's in uh, some trouble, and yet he's got the, the second fastest season's best. But it's Chesham and Tabe and Cheriut in the 1-2-3. Could it be a gold, silver and bronze for Kenya? looking like it could be. Just for the viewers, uh, it is uh, arm amputee, but it's more that people might be missing a limb, as you can see some of them are, or others have a classification, could be something like Herb's palsy or a neurological a nerve impingement from birth that really restricts their movement of their arm, so similar to compare to um, someone who's had an amputation or born congenitally with their, their arm missing. So that's why you do see the the variety there, but they've been classified so that their, their range of function should be a level playing field. So now we see uh, Samir Nua of uh, Algeria going to the front. Now here's the man with the fastest season's best, Nua of Algeria. And in there's the, the bill. 
for the final lap. They're already starting to step up the pace. It's uh, near of uh, Algeria, Chesham and Tarbe from Kenya. The other Kenyan, they've dropped back now. And uh, it's Nia of Algeria down the back straight. Tarbe, world record holder of 3 minutes 52.50. Paralympic record as well. Can he come through and dominate over the world record that he has? So they've Here's dropped. the fight. It's Indelbu is up with them as well, the Ethiopian. And these three now away. So in the lead, it's Tarbe. The world record holder. Can he hold it? Coming back into the home straight. He's striding out beautifully. There's no way anybody's getting close to him. He looked over his shoulder and uh, what a fantastic runner. Looking at a time and yes, he's done it. He's done it, it's a world record. Tarbe has broken his own world record. Fantastic, he came away there and it was almost as though he used the other two Kenyans to get him in a position and then he just launched. And he's not only set a new world record, he's taken over two seconds off he it. He smashed the world record. Tarbe Beautiful of Kenya. Runner. Abraham Tarbe, 350-15, winner of the men's T46 with a world record 350-15, ahead of Indelbu of Ethiopia, 350-87 with a personal best, and Nur of Algeria, again with a personal best, 351-80. And uh, David Among of Uganda with a personal best as well in fourth place. So the top four all setting PBs but it's Abraham Tarbe who set a new world record. Look at him, he was like, you're not gonna catch me. <laughs> the other two competitors as they're coming round to that last bend were feeling the pain, feeling the lactic, feeling tired. He just said, if you can't chase me, you're not getting gold. And it reminded me a little bit of uh, Mo Farah at the Olympics when uh, the, the kind of acceleration, uh, when he, you just see three people and one of them can put their foot down on the gas and just get away. And, uh, and he did that brilliantly there. I just don't know how athletes can run with big chains around their neck. This always bothers me. I think as an athlete, I couldn't stand having something jiggling around as I'm running, a bit of a distraction, but a lot of athletes, it's something that they do. And You don't want anything jiggling around when you're running. Athletes of the world, throw off your chains. Now well, you maybe gold brings gold, so maybe that's... Uh, that's his lucky necklace. Well, we've seen a silver for silver in the previous race. Now a gold chain has brought Abraham Tarbe gold. I did promise some questions to you, and we've banked yes. up a few now on Twitter. Okay. Are you ready for these? It's question time. And Katrina Webb. Uh, Matthew Pereira says, I think it's great that the guides for the track events are getting medals. I agree. But how come the field event Ladies guides don't get medals? Girls, I suppose it's because they don't really do anything athletic, do they? Yeah, it's a good question. I, uh, we've been sort of talking about this today. Why and who makes that decision when, when I know the people on the track are running and they're doing it, but when you look at, say, the T11 long jump today, they would not have been able to jump without their guides calling and telling them exactly where they are. So it's a team effort there. Um, it's a good one for some discussion. But in, you know, in the cycling, the, the pilot riders all get the medal, so I think I'm really of the opinion if uh, if an athlete Ladies couldn't achieve the their result without Poland, that guide, I think everyone Rafael should be getting a medal. Good answer. Home Secretary Theresa May is uh, presenting the medals here. You just heard some of the crowd booed. Um, Home Secretary in charge of law and order in the United Kingdom. Can you explain why, maybe? I, well, just because at the moment we've got a coalition government and I suppose probably 50% of the country would have voted for her party and 50% perhaps wouldn't, and so those that didn't would have booed and those that supported her would just keep quiet because, you know, you don't necessarily cheer someone just because you voted for them. It's but not we, being good It's not in the Paralympics. like in the games. Well, you say that. Last night in the Paralympics, um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, which is our finance yeah, minister, he got booed as well. And... Uh, Daniel Peck. And I noticed that NBC were saying, you know, this, this was not on the British crowd, we're booing the finance minister. And I thought, yeah, but we do, but Brit British people are a bit rebellious, you know. We, I know we're very polite and very friendly and very warm and we've put on a brilliant games and we love you all for coming, but then we do tend to boo our own politicians. That's just, that's just what we do. But there we are, we, we riot, but we never revolt. That's, that's the thing with London, we never have revolutions.
Just there we go, our two Polish athletes getting bronze cork and now Peck getting the silver. The gold medalist and Paralympic champion representing the Islamic Republic of Iran, Payman Naziri Bazanjani. He ran a great race, didn't he? He was fantastic, Bazanjani. Just before we hear the Iranian anthem, Stephen Mutai would like to know what is the minimum and maximum qualifying age for athletes? If there is one, I don't think there is, is there? I think if you Oh, good enough, you're old enough. Well, I know uh, the youngest Australian, and uh, I just noticed because she medalled yesterday, first ever younger, well, youngest Paralympian at age 13 for us, and first youngest ever to medal. She got gold, silver, and bronze. So, I'll, I'll let me just get back to you on that. I'll do a bit of search, but I reckon there is a minimum age. She doesn't know, Stephen, uh, is the answer. It's uh, either 13 and above. Okay, those meddling Australians. <laughs> I'll let you know. Those who are able, please stand for the national anthem of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And that's one very happy Iranian. And as always in the uh, stadium, they always say, for those that are able, please stand for the national anthem. And everyone stands up, whatever anthem it is that played, and they all get a warm round of applause Ladies watching the flags go up. On the far side of the arena, the long jump is about to finish. We now know who is going to win the gold medal. Jose Antonio Exposito Pinero. So the long jump uh, continuing. Uh, we'll bring you pictures there. We've got the men's 400 T36 final coming up. Anne Carvalho says, we're listening to you from South Africa, loving your commentary, rolling on the floor laughing. That's nice. Thank you. We're having fun in here. and uh, But you know what? The Paralympic Games has this sense of fun about it as well. Uh, you see it's professional, it's elite, but when you're a part of the movement in the village, the things that... Uh, we do is is have a lot of fun as athletes um, so I'm glad to be feeling that element with you here Jeremy <laughs> too tonight yes yeah, it's a very friendly game isn't it? it's, it's more friendly even than the Olympics I think going there to the seated discus it's a lovely picture by the way on uh, the Paralympic Games Facebook page of Prince Harry with uh, Maddie, who's the youngest member of the Australian Paralympic team. Oh, wonderful. Uh, she's got a gold, a silver, and a bronze. That's who I was talking about just before. Absolutely. Maddie Ellen, wonderful. I 13 years of age. Didn't recognise Prince Harry with his clothes on, <laughs> but there he is. <laughs> uh, T-shirt and jeans. I'll tell you what, I'm impressed, though. There's a fair bit of royalty around. I was at the track this morning, and... Uh, um, we had Prince Frederick. I don't know if you, you weren't, uh, we weren't commentating this morning, but uh, Prince Frederick, the Danish uh, prince, was there presenting some medals. Um, the Prince of Sweden was also there today watching. So uh, Kate Middleton, as you've seen many nights, has been watching. So it's been great to get support from, from royalty, particularly around Europe. Does it make you wish you had a royal family in Australia? Well, the royals here are our royals. Oh, yes, of course, you borrow ours, don't yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. You borrow ours. We borrow yours. We have the Queen on the back of our coins. Do you? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And you have the Union Jack on your flag, don't you? Yes. Do you think that will ever change? Because I always think, you know, you should have a yellow and green flag, really. Ladies yeah, and it brings in, we do have a lot of debate around this, whether we should bring our Indigenous flag into our flag as well. But you're welcome to borrow our Queen for as long as you need one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Ah, there's the, the man. There's Prince Edward. Prince Edward. By His Royal Highness. The Earl of Wessex. Now he gets a big cheer. 
by Mr. Keith Williams, Chief Executive of British Airways. It's whatever so you love your royalty, but you don't like your government. That, that's why we have a royal family, because we can boo politicians, but we'll always love the Queen. Italy, Annalisa Minetti and her guide runner, Andrea Giocondi. See, if you have an elected president, you can never quite feel the same as for, for a monarch, because you, you might well have voted against that president. But we will always love the Queen in whatever times of crisis. Keep your questions coming in then too. My guest is Katrina Webb. I say guest, she's co-commentator. It's half her oh, show, really. I'm, I'm your guest. Um, and uh, she'll answer any question on the Paralympics from her experience as a competitor, a commentator, ambassador, and lunch guest with the rich and famous of the Paralympic world. At Paralympic is our Twitter. What is it, Twitter name? Yeah, Twitter name. Twitter name? Yeah, I wanted to say address, but it's not. It's a Twitter name. At Paralympic, and if it sounds, if I'm quiet here, I'm doing some great research for our for our viewers. No minimum age limit for athletes competing in the Paralympic Games Ladies is stipulated by the IPC the on a general basis. So if you're good enough, Spain, you're old enough. Elena Gongos. Chris on Twitter says completely agree about the fun with Paralympic sport. I work for Australian wheelchair rugby team in 07. It was a fun time. I'm doing some commentary on wheelchair rugby. I think tomorrow. One of my favourite sports, murder ball as it was first known as, and uh, now wheelchair rugby. But uh, we do this in Australia with corporates uh, as fundraiser for the Australian Paralympic Committee, and uh, the corporate community absolutely loves it. I bet they do. There's Elena who got the silver, and, and the other Elena got the gold. The gold medalist, the Paralympic champion, representing the Russian Federation, Elena Pautova. Elena Powter, very my favourite tracksuit of the games. Let's have a quick question before we go to the Russian anthem from at Paralympic on Twitter. What happens to all those flat screen TVs after the Paralympics are over, says Ashley Greaves. I'm guessing it means the big ones in the stadium. Yeah. I think Ashley fancies one of them on the wall. It's a, well, it's a good point. Maybe we'll keep an eye out. I yeah. know even with the cars that are being here for, the, for us to be driven around in, I think there's a right of refusal for all the volunteers who have um, to buy, really? of course, but uh, they need to do something with all of these cars too. So for the people that have volunteered very kindly their time, they have a chance to, to buy one of the BMW mm. vehicles. Are you getting driven around? I'm, I'm on the tube. I have been. Outrageous. Here's the Russian anthem. So the Times on Twitter saying the greatest legacy of the Paralympics may be the change in attitudes to disability. That's the Times of London newspaper. Well done for saying this. And, and for me, this is something that's really driven me as an athlete. Um, someone who's had very mild cerebral palsy and uh, to really try and change people's first impressions, I suppose, particularly of people with disability is something that has been very dear to my heart. Algerian discus thrower there. And, and do you think it is changing? Have you have you seen it? I, I mean, felt it personally. Really? Uh, yeah. Um, we still have a. It, this is still a long way to go. Um, but when you see what we're seeing on the screen, when you're seeing athletes that 
look like athletes. They just happen to have a disability. Uh, for me, is a place we're getting to, but uh, is new ground. Paralympic record there for Nasima Saifi of Algeria in the F57-58 final. And she set a world record in her category. We don't get a minute, do we? It's <laughs> what, you just and get the discus. That's right. And then suddenly it's the men's, men's 400. Men's 400 metres T36 class. Okay, okay, T36. Have another go. T, T for track, three, yes. three for cerebral palsy, six for not particularly... Uh, impaired. Middle of the yeah, middle, middle of the road. Middle, yeah. yeah, eight would be not particularly impaired. Would That's it? right. Yeah, eight's okay. the mildest. Six is usually um, lower limbs affected. I feel under pressure when you ask me those. You're doing great. Quiz. We can have a bit of a quiz <laughs> quiz going. Yeah, maybe send us questions in. <laughs> maybe there could be a gift for the winner. <laughs> uh, Cheryl van der Merwe says um, it's a Twitter handle. Yeah, a Twitter handle. You know, I saying is it Twitter name or Twitter address? A Twitter handle. Twitter handle. Yeah, you know, I was saying is it a Twitter name or address? And uh, they'd like to follow you, but your account is locked apparently. Do you have an account I on do. Twitter? All oh, right. Okay. Oh, you should be able to. Oh, maybe I have to say yes. I'll let you follow me. So uh, send oh, me a request, it. and I'll I'll be doing it as we speak tonight. What is your Twitter handle? My handle yeah. is Katrina L Webb. My middle name is Lee, so Katrina L. Webb. I couldn't get Katrina Webb because someone else had it before me. Katrina L. Webb. Yeah, I couldn't get Jeremy Nicholas. I had to have Jeremy underscore Nicholas because <laughs> my middle name is underscore. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so here we go. Paul Blake, lane five. Wow, what a moment for him. Just 22 years of age from Great Britain. His PB is 55.20, which he set earlier this year. And he'll be one of the favourites in this race because he's, uh, he's got far and away the best PB. There's the Russian. So the competition could well come from uh, Shvetkov, we saw the other night from Russia. That's the other Russian, Arafiev. And Mia Che of China, Che Mian, and Andrei Zhernov on the outside from Russia. Just looking at the different countries in these races, Russia and Ukraine and Great Britain, we were talking today at lunch just saying how can we get the Paralympic, Paralympic movement into other countries, other developing countries, and I think you'll see now for the next four to eight years emphasis placed on countries like India mm. that are uh, really not participating in the Games. So 2682, Shvetkov of Russia, look out for him, and 2306 in the colours of Great Britain, white and blue. World record of 54.13. It's the men's 400 metres, T36 for runners with cerebral palsy, the final. Gold, silver and bronze on offer. And the world record holder, Roman Pavlik, in the race. Lane four. And they're out of the blocks as fast, going well. Just getting the feed. Pavlik is storming in lane four. Roman Pavlik, the world record holder, is going extremely well. The Brits going very well, Blake as well. But it's uh, Pavlik who's going very well. Both the Russians doing well as well. Shvetkov, it's hard to see who's going to get this one. It's uh, Shvetkov in the lead. He's being tracked by the Briton, Blake. It's Shvetkov, then Blake, then it's the other Russian. And uh, the Ukrainian who went off really quickly, Pavlik, uh, is now coming back into it. But it's uh, Shvetkov in the lead. Yevgeny Shvetkov being tracked by Paul Blake of Great Britain. The crowd roaring Blake on, but it's Shvetkov who's going to get it. Shvetkov of Russia is going to get gold. Blake will get the silver, and the Ukrainian will have to settle for bronze. They're just tying up a little bit towards the end, but Shvetkov of Russia gets he, it, and it's a world record. He was tiring at the end. He didn't even finish through the line to break a real world record, 53-32. All three of the, the lead runners there just seemed that they didn't enjoy the last uh, 30 <laughs> metres or so. They just tied up because they'd given so much. The lactic acid really builds up in a race like that. And 53-31 uh, for Evgeny Shvetkov. That is a new world record. Personal best for Paul Blake in second. Personal best for the former world record holder, Roman Pavlik of the Ukraine, in third. And the Russians absolutely oh, delighted. Absolutely delighted. And you could see quite interesting in the, in the race how his cerebral palsy actually affects his face as well. 
um, and coming around the bend, even just that mo that motion in his face doesn't seem to throw. You can look here now, he's sort of, there's his cerebral palsy, just kicking in and he's coming around, checking the field, but it is still involuntary sort of spasm, I suppose, that I can talk about. Normally with cerebral palsy, you do see athletes really start to tire, but look at him go. Thank he has worked so hard to make sure that his strength overpowers the tiredness you can get from having cerebral palsy. And, and just, is it because he's got cerebral palsy that he gets tired or is it because he gets tired that his cerebral palsy shows more or is it both? Because it, 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 both. It, seem, it yes. seems when he's tired that he, yes. you can see he's he, more obviously that he has cerebral palsy. Well, you look at the times they're running, 53.31, uh, that is fast. Mm. It is fast. So to have, if you could understand the level um, of their tone and tension they have in their body, just to move around, to, to run 53 seconds is incredible. And these guys train full time. They have probably had moments where they, their cerebral palsy really kicks in. But just like, I was going to say like you or me, but I have cerebral <laughs> palsy, but uh, now I'm not competing anymore. But like anybody, if you're not trained and prepared, you will tire. So just because they have cerebral palsy, um, that shouldn't you know, impact because their level of training should override their mm. disability towards the end and great example of it yeah my only disability is premature baldness <laughs> which uh, and i looked and there's not an event for that so looks like i'll never be a paralympian and also i was dreadful at sport at school i play a bit of golf but there we are uh, let's just get a few questions uh, marcus g fisher says what about an online vote to see which tracksuit is the best marcus goes for russia first ukraine second ah. and uh People saying it's great to uh, have a Paralympic commentators, in, you know, have a Paralympian who's in the commentary box. So oh, that's from you. Christian. It's very enjoyable to be here and to have this opportunity to commentate in the box. I, I can tell you I don't know everything. I know a fair bit about the sport, being involved for 17 years, but I will make some mistakes, and if I do, please correct me. Zoran Talic of Croatia lying second in the long jump. Just getting the crowd behind him. Keep your questions coming in on at Paralympic on Twitter. And again, that's well over seven metres. Is it Katrina with a K? It is a Katrina with a K. Okay. Oh, we're still having problems. Uh, just uh, Nadine Erasmus says... Uh, Katrina L Web account doesn't exist, but she spelt Katrina with a okay. C, and that'll be why. And, and it's it got two B's. And two B's in Web. Yes. But other than that, Nadine, great spelling. So <laughs> it's Katrina, K A T R I N A L W E B B. That's right. Or you can go to my website, which is katrinaweb.com.au, and there's a link straight to my Twitter account from there, which might be easier. Fantastic. Uh, now, Danielle says, did the athlete who proposed to his girlfriend when he won his medal say yes to him? And I know what that means. That was uh, Johansson Nascimento, uh, who was a Brazilian. Uh, this is when you were off at one of your parties and I was having to, to slum it with Chris Waddell as my expert. And uh, what happened was Johansson Nascimento on Sunday night uh, won the gold on the track and then he held up a little bit of paper to his girlfriend saying, Talita, will you marry me? Well, Brazilian Channel TV Sport came up to the rescue, linked the pair up by phone, so Talita, who was overcome, could say, could say. yes. She what said a yes, great Daniel. Story. Lovely story. Talita is marrying Johansson Nascimento. Lovely Sunday night for them. Let's see how the Spaniard does in the long jump. Oh, might have been a foul. Is I it clear? No, I think it's a foul. It is a foul. It just looked like his foot was few centimetres. We'll keep the red flag flying here. We can see the replay. Have a look where his foot placement is. A good half a foot. Oh, maybe only a couple of centimetres. A bit too far. Wonderful technique though. We just need to fix. Oh, that was his last. That's uh, his last attempt. So only getting three there, but uh, the third one that counts. Seven twenty-five. 
Fantastic. And I do like those go faster stripes that he's got with the pink and black <laughs> taped on the back. Presumably that just uh, prevents any kind of muscle seizing up. Yes. He may be having uh, problems with his calves or... Uh, so just to, you're right, just to make sure he's in good shape. And look at that, 7.25. His uh, PB was 7.24. What a great, <laughs> what a great uh, game to do one centimetre extra to get a Paralympic record and to take home that gold medal. Dominating by a good 16 centimetres there. So Spain get the gold, Croatia the silver and Portugal get the bronze. And before you know it, we're back out on the track for the men's 400 metres T46 uh -huh. final. This should be a good race. T46 arm um, amputees. Heath Francis there, world record holder from Australia. He won three gold medals at the Beijing Paralympic Games. I trained with Heath for some of my uh, career. Very talented athlete and he in fact is here commentating um, with Australian TV. So he'll be calling this race right now to see whether his world record will be broken. So let's see. Just looking at uh, the times once again. Always look for the middle lanes for the uh, the fastest qualifiers and the fastest season's best time, 49.23, and that's Matzinger of Austria. There's uh, Xi of China, qualified in a time of 50.74. Brazilian in lane three. Souza. 30 years of age, season's best of 50.19. And there is Johansson Nascimento. He's the chap who asked his girlfriend to marry him. Talita, you remember? And there he is. And she said yes. She did. She was absolutely delighted. So he's got a gold medal. He's uh, got a wedding on the way. And will he get another medal tonight? There's the Rwandan. And the Austrian. Gunter Matzinger. That's the fastest time so far this year out of these runners. The name for you? The Sri Lankan Pathirinahilag. Well done. Would it be mean of me to say I hope he's not in contention? Because it's very hard to say that at speed. <laughs> Pathirinahilag. Pathirinahilag. Adul Kimol from Ivory Coast and uh, Aristi from Cyprus. Yes, yeah, CIV always catches people out. Cote d'Ivoire. Ivory Coast, as we call it. So keep your eye on lane five and lane six. Obviously, always the fastest qualifiers go into these lanes. Mavunyi of Rwanda in lane five. Matzinger of Austria in lane six. They're under starters' orders. And they're away. And who's going to be the quickest out? We can't really see yet till we get the wide camera shot. But uh, we can see that uh, Nascimento of Brazil going very well in lane three. Our old friend Johansson Nascimento. And the Austrian as well, Matzinger, is going very well indeed. And also in the outside lane, Aresti of Cyprus has gone off very fast indeed. He could well even be in the lead. We'll wait when the bend comes around. Aresti of Cyprus. It's the men's 400 metres. I think once uh, the bend unfurls, we'll see that... Uh, Nascimento on the inside is doing very well and Matzinger as well. They're coming round this bend now. Matzinger just going to take to the lead. It's Matzinger in the middle from Austria. Just ahead of Nascimento from Brazil and on the near side, Aresti from Cyprus. But it's going to be Matzinger to get it. Nascimento's going to get second and the Sri Lankan, whose name's too long to say before he goes across <laughs> the line, gets the bronze. We didn't see any world records time there, but a uh, very convincing win. Yep, you called that one spot on. It's Gunter Matzinger of Austria with a regional record of 48.45. He comes scarily close to the camera. Followed by Nazimento from Brazil with a time of 49.21. And uh, a regional <laughs> record as well for Patherin Halag. I can tell you're pausing because you think, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let Jeremy <laughs> say that. Halag? One. 
Yeah. 49-28. 26-year-old from Sri Lanka. And you can just see the lactic, the pain. These athletes have given everything. You come out of the bend, which is the most important part to get momentum to come into the home straight. This is where it really, really hurts. You can see the pain on a lot of faces. But our winner, Matsinga, controlled and runs through to the line. Just explain lactic acid to me. Um, my wife runs marathons and she's always talking about lactic acid. And uh, as I understand it, it's something you get in your muscles when it you is. do you do something uh, fast and then you have to do slow stuff to get rid of it. What, yeah. what is it then? Well, it's a build up in the muscles and the best way to describe it from running many 400 metres, we used to say our bottom feels like it's on fire if you <laughs> good <laughs> explanation oh, you see this this is australians lowering the tone again i do apologize uh, but uh, you know particularly your smaller muscles tend to tire quicker so your shin muscles and your calf muscles and and then as you get to the end of 400 you really will feel it in your quadriceps your hamstrings and your your bottom muscles your gluteals uh it it's an awful feeling. It's a, it's a, you know that you've really worked hard once you get to the line and you've got that feeling. But, yeah, walking it out, um, keep moving after the race is one of the important things you can do and then get fuel into you straight away. If these guys are competing, which they probably are, they'll go straight back underneath the stadium, get their clothing, put it on, head mm. back to the warm-up track while they're eating food just to get themselves... Well, they'll know. be what, cycling on a still bike or something? Or? Oh, yeah, or do a couple of laps of the warm-up track. And how long does it take Have for a that, good stretch. How long does it take for the lactic acid to work out then? Oh, look, by the time they've already got their, mm. their gear, they're probably feeling OK. Uh, the more highly trained you are, the better you can deal with it. He's happy with that. <laughs> the Frenchman, I think he might have done something special here. He's, he can't wait for it to be measured, can he? Let's Frenchman see if we can help you out here. We'll get some results up. Well, it's the best celebration yet. If only we could see a distance, we can tell you what he's done. I'm predicting he might have done 12.86 and it has come up. He's thrown a regional record. Thierry Simon of France, regional record 12.86. And that puts him into second place in the competition. And quite rightly happy because it's uh, a 24 centimetre PB. So well done, Thierry Simon. Um, not so much questions, but just comments. Kerry Webb says, uh, I love the fact that all I see are sportsmen and women giving 100%, Ladies not people with disabilities. Great last name, Kerry Webb. <laughs> this is what I absolutely love about this Games, is seeing athletes and the fantastic physiques they've got. And then you realise, oh, gee, actually they the have a disability. We're going to use the Royal Highness a lot while he's here tonight. This is his third ceremony, I think. Ah, but you see, we love our royals, but we love our champions even more. Tessa Sanderson, brilliant javelin thrower, Olympic gold medalist. And she's from East London as well. She's a shining example. I've interviewed her many times at West Ham at the football. Uh, she came along. Uh, when we when we just beat Paris to get the games, Tessa Sanderson came along at half time and gave us a really good speech on the pitch. Eugene on Twitter, commitment of Paralympic athletes even better than Usain Bolt. Great stuff. And Adele Dupree in uh, South Africa says, I'm watching the Paralympics in South Africa instead of doing my homework. <laughs> That's naughty. And Reed McCracken. There's that great name. Oh, he's the 15-year-old Aussie. He is the young Aussie. What an incredible experience <laughs> for him, for a young athlete. Look at that. Young schoolboy. You should be doing your homework. Well, here he is, not doing any homework, <laughs> winning a bronze medal for the London 2012 Paralympic Games. Is it, is it school holidays in Australia at the moment, or is he bunking off? No, he, he's uh, having some time off. Yeah. Do you say bunking off? That's, <laughs> no. a, that's our expression for Maybe me. wagging. 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 In, the, in Great Britain, we say bunking off when you're, not, when you're meant to be at school and you're not. Dawn says, in London, uh, that dazzled the world with new records, outstanding performances, and the biggest smiles. We have seen some great smiles, haven't we, at these games? We have. You're listening to Katrina Webb and me, Jeremy Nicholas, at the London 2012 Paralympics. And here's the gold medalist. And Paralympic champion, the representing Tunisia, 
Walid Kutila. Kutila. He pushed a fantastic race. Dominated. And uh, look at that, receiving his gold medal. Chico on Twitter says, these Paralympics teach the world nothing's impossible and our world leaders can learn from this. I certainly can. I think the Paralympics is inspiring the world. Please like the Paralympic Games on our Facebook group, Paralympic Games, and uh, follow the Paralympic movement at, at Paralympic. When you hear from athletes, though, from Paralympic athletes, they'll often say to you, but we, we don't feel like we're inspiring because we're just doing like you all do. We're just working hard and trying to be our best. I think that's just a nice message from the Games. Absolutely. Ladies and gentlemen, your Paralympic medalists. So I'll just tell you uh, what happens during the, the national anthems. So we take our headphones off and we just keep quiet during the anthems. Next door, I just have to whisper in case he is, next door the Spanish commentator is always very, very loud. I think he does stop during the anthems, but when he starts up again, he starts up very loud, doesn't he? You know he? what we should do is print the national anthems off and really just try and belt them out mm. <laughs> for the countries. Let's do that, Katrina. Last night at the Games, let's do karaoke anthem night. <laughs> okay. That would be great, the, wouldn't it? The listeners can, uh, viewers can rank us. Right, I've got... Ten I've just out of ten. I'm going to get you some more questions now. Here's Kaidi from Iran in his fourth attempt. He's got, he's got the look of uh, sort of Elvis Presley type hair, hasn't he? <laughs> he does. Stylish character. Here we Here go. Here he goes. I just know he's going to make a lot of noise because he has done with his previous throws. Here he goes. And look at the judges watching his technique. What they're looking for there is that his bottom doesn't lift up off of the chair until the forward movement. So on that replay, you can see the judges or the technical people really looking to make sure that one foot stays on the ground at all times and that his buttocks don't lift up until that forward release movement. So they'll be DQ'd otherwise. So and they get their three throws. So this is Mosin Kaidi of uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, 25 years of age. He's quite young to be an Elvis fan, but 12.94, he, he almost talks himself up, doesn't he? Let's get myself pumped up. Well, every, every athlete needs to have their, their regime, what really gets them fired, and uh, what works for some doesn't work for others. So just because you see a certain athlete doing a certain thing, like, for example, Bolt, doesn't mean everyone needs to ceremony. follow that. You need to work out what works for you and practice it in training. have another victory the ceremony will be presented by Mr. Patrick Jarvis governing board member of the International Paralympic Committee who is accompanied by Ms. Tessa Sanderson CBE Olympic gold medalist Tessa so you're a bit of a name drop I haven't met either of these so have you not met go. Tessa I haven't no the bronze medalist I did a radio quiz show with Tessa Angola, um, I've interviewed Jose her on a pitch Sayoro and I've interviewed her at the Armando ideal health show at Earl's Court and his guide runner Nicola Palanza. 
And a question saying, is uh, Joanna Benson the first Namibian ever to win a Paralympic medal? And fortunately, someone's already answered it for us, saying that uh, Reginald Bernade won Namibia's first medal in the 2008 Paralympics with a bronze. So Joanna is the second one for Namibia. Question for Jeremy. Sorry, sorry Katrina, that's OK. <laughs> Are you booked for a commentary at the Rio 2016 Paralympics yet? I haven't been booked yet, but um, I'm hoping that at some point I'll get to go to a lunch with Katrina and she'll say, Jeremy, <laughs> this is the mayor of Rio de Janeiro. Would Jeremy, they're listening to you already. Let's we'll see. Terry says, uh, Terry Hickman, Nee Shackleton says, when an athlete has a guide runner and they win a medal each, does it count as one or two medals on the results board? Just one. Just one medal. Ladies and gentlemen, the silver medalist representing Brazil, Daniel Silva. There's Silva getting his silver. And he's very happy with silver. Look at that. <laughs> what would he do if he got the gold, hey? Who knows? <laughs> Daniel Silver, he's so happy. That's a great that, reaction. That's a taste of what we're going to get in Rio. Oh look, look at him. He's gone down. He's gone down uh. on one knee. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Go on, fella. Milk it. Go on. That's right. Love it. <laughs> what a brilliant bloke. <laughs> oh, what a great moment. That was great because he knew the world was watching him. Why not? <laughs> Why not, as you said, milk it? He may never, ever be in this position ever again. And what's he going to do to Tessa? He's going in for a cuddle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel oh, Silver getting great. a silver. And ladies and gentlemen, the gold medalist, the Paralympic champion representing Brazil, Felipe Gomez, and his guide runner, Leonardo Souza Lopez. We have to piggyback to <laughs> the gold medal position. Well done to Gomez. Well, this is this bodes well for Rio, doesn't it? The Brazilians so enthusiastic about this sport. We know that they love their football. They've been the dominating force in world football for years. But now we're seeing them come to the fore in all of these uh, Olympic sports and Paralympic sports. But it's just the enthusiasm of the people, I think, that you just know it's going to be a great Games. It's going to be a great Games. All the athletes that I've spoken to are really excited about it. They're, they're absolutely loving London, but everybody's thinking, Gee, it's going to be a hell of a party in Rio. I think that's the thing. I think us Brits, we're quite good at organising, aren't we? We're very good at putting on a show. But I tell you what, we put on a good show, but the Brazilians will put on a great party. That's, that'll be the difference. That'll be the thing, won't it? Yes, the, the, the venues w might not be as fantastic as these venues are. Uh, they will do everything they can with what they have. A lot of their stadiums are quite old. They will try and make them as good as they can, but they will bring the atmosphere and the energy. Talking of Rio, here's the Brazilian anthem.
Maybe that's the first uh, anthem we need to learn the words for because I think we're going to be hearing it a lot in Rio. I think we will. So Celeste Combrink uh, says, can we please explain the different classifications? Well, we have explained them a, a few times, can't, but let's just have a quick run through then in general terms. In general terms, okay. So when we look at the T for athletics, that's always mean the track event. F will mean field event. If we're looking at the 11s like as we are now, 11, 12, 13, uh, vision impaired category. Um, 11 being the most severe, so always the lower the number, the more severe. So as you can see why these guys have guides, um, they probably can't see much, if not anything at all. Uh, 12s are a bit less and 13s are the, the ones with the, the least amount, or the, the most amount of vision. Then you go to your 40 class, as we see here, which is your amputees. Uh, 46 is arm amputees and as you come down 44, 43 we know uh, because of Oscar Pistorius that's the leg amputee class. And, that, and that's why because Nascimento uh, is double amputee uh, he can get a world record even though he finished second because the guy above him was a single amputee, yes. arm amputee. And look the more we find athletes around the world it would be great to have pure classes. Mm. Um, we just need to get a lot more numbers of people in so we could have a 43 race only and a 44 race only then we have uh, the 30s which is cerebral palsy which we've seen a little bit of tonight so t3 anything means cerebral, cerebral palsy. palsy low number after it means more severe yes high number less severe and if we see a five it's in a chair so wheelchair races and that could be paraplegic to quadriplegic to someone who um, may have had significant poly anything that makes them um, in a chair. So it doesn't have to be a spinal injury, it could be something from birth. Um, and again, the higher the, the classification, the more mild they are in the chair. So I hope that's a bit more of an understanding. T20 is intellectually disabled class. And uh, SD Brit says, why aren't there any hearing impaired athletes? Hear hearing impaired have their own Olympics called the Deaf Olympics. And uh, I know just within conversations, they are very happy to remain as their own identity. Okay. I think there is yeah. Oksana. Gee, she's been out on the track many a times this week, and she still looks fresh. She's one of my favourite athletes. I love her technique, but this is the world record holder, the French Hanoni, fantastic athlete. She's been around for quite a few games, and well, this is going to be a good race. So there's uh, Asia El Hanoni. There's the Brazilian, you'll remember her from the other night with the very natty blindfold. <laughs> Maybe that's what the Brazilians will do. They will say if you're going to use blindfolds or prosthetic limbs or wheelchairs, you've just got to dress them up party style. Absolutely. Decorate the games. So we're going to see who's going to do well here. El Hanuni of uh, France, Botticherk of Ukraine. And T12, as we know, vision impaired. They have a choice whether they use a guide or not. Hence why we're seeing two athletes on their own and one with a guide. So uh, Kiamina of Brazil in the outside lane with the, the natty blindfold with the guide runner. El Hanouni of France inside. And they're away. And the crowd just making a bit of a noise. So well, false, they're calling false, them back. false start. There seemed to be a bit of a noise from the crowd um, just before they went, and I wasn't sure if that was something happening in a field event or, or whether they were responding because someone went early. So we're not quite sure what's happened there. But we'll just uh, see if a red card or a green card comes up. Could just be a warning. It's a green card, so everything's okay. I think there maybe there was a bit of noise like you're talking about. Oksana Botticek of Ukraine getting the green card. Green card means you're not out of it, but watch yourself. Yes. And when this happens, you've got to come back to, your, mm. to the back of your blocks. You've really got to focus. 
because you've already been there, you're already set. Just get yourself back into that focus position. And obviously in any kind of a sprint, it's important for the crowd to be quiet, but when the visually impaired athletes, even more so because they're relying so much on their hearing. This afternoon I went to watch uh, the blind football, five-a-side football, um, where they, they wear the, uh, the blind folds, and so they're totally reliant on any any small amount of vision they have is taken away from them they're reliant totally on hearing the sound in the ball and they the commentator in the stadium kept saying could the crowd please be quiet now it's the only football match i've ever been to where they try and quiet <laughs> yeah. the crowd usually they try and g the crowd up so we're going to have a, a second start in this race guiamina of brazil el hanuni inside and botterchuk inside that and this time they are away cleanly World Maldonado record of 53.67 to look out for. So Guillamina in the outside lane with the guide runner going extremely well. But uh, El Hanani and uh, Oksana Gortachuk look like they're going at the same pace at the moment. We'll see the stagger start to pick up as we come around into the, the uh, 300 metres, 200 metre mark. And it looks to me like El Hanani is now coming through, certainly taking Guillamina of Brazil. El Hanani. Uh, from France in the lead and Botticherk is coming through now but uh, still El Hanani of France is going to take gold but here comes Botticherk of the Ukraine it's the French girl Asia El Hanani in the lead 31 years of age with the 27 year old Ukrainians coming fast can she catch her no she won't she's run out of time El Hanani of France wins gold in the women's 400 T12 final Botticherk of Ukraine getting the silver there and that was a good race. It looked like the Ukrainian for a while might catch the French girl. And the, I think the Brazilians the have fallen over. <laughs> oh. oh, that's a shame. Well, we've seen it a couple of times tonight. El Hanini, her experience, world record holder, still elated, of course. You're never guaranteed to win a gold medal, even when you're a world record holder and you've won gold before. It's even harder, I think, when, you, when you're in this position. Oh, the Brazilian's going over the line now to a big cheer. It's important in your race, if you do fall over, still get up and still finish because it's your race, it's your moment. Oh, she's talking to mum, dad, husband, boyfriend. President of France. <laughs> Who knows? Hello, who is this? Sorry, can I call you back? I've just won a medal. Bye. Yeah, love you. Yeah. <laughs> I've got more important <laughs> things to do. I've got to run a, my uh, lap of honour with my flag. Yeah. Beautiful style. Really focused. Look at that. And that, this is the hard part of the race. You're really feeling tired and, and uh, it's kind of like a big bear jumps on your back, some 400 metre athletes will describe. You just hit that last 100 metres and you just have to run with whatever you can find and she certainly did this no one was going to take this medal away from El Hanini she looks so calm I'm always amazed at how they managed to keep their heads so still not a fast time 55 39 a couple of seconds off the world record great result <laughs> thumbs up, two thumbs up. <laughs> Anarchies. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Uh, but very tired. I know that feeling. I've got a couple of shots of when I finished my 400 in Athens and I was fortunate enough to be in that same position. But, uh, a couple of shots I can see that exhaustion on my face too. There she goes though. She's found that energy and you do find that energy when you've managed to win gold. She's doing a her lap of honour with the French flag. Well done, Asia El Halonini with uh, her third consecutive gold medal in uh, that race. At 31 years of age, winning the 400 metres T12 for the third time. Botichuk of Ukraine getting the silver, 27 years of age with a, a PB for her, 55.69, and the Mexican getting the bronze. Now it's the 1500 girls, medal ceremony. Victory ceremony this time for T46. The T46 She's arm um, amputees. The 
medals this evening will be presented by Mr. Patrick Jarvis, governing board member of the International Paralympic Committee, who is accompanied by Sir Ian Johnston, Director of Security for LOCOG. It's a big job for him to be the Director of Security for LOCOG. But they've done a superb job. Medalist, it's uh, quite difficult to get into the stadium Samia and to get to where we are Nui tonight Ua. going through the security. They check everything and uh, scan your accreditation. But what a superb games. Yes, it does take a long time to get into anything. Uh, even even coming into the Olympic Park, they, they won't let you bring any water in. I know. You have to you have to drink. If you have a bottle of water with you, have to drink it in front of them, and then you can bring <laughs> the empty bottle in and fill it up at a tap once you're inside, but you can't bring one in. Same as like on aeroplanes. Mm -hmm. But that's fair enough. If it uh, keeps us all safe, we're happy. It's just that I forgot this morning and I had a Coke with me and, uh, and, it, and I, I couldn't drink it quickly because I knew I was going to commentate and it's fizzy and I didn't want to be burping on air, so I just tipped it away. And that's a waste. <laughs> oh, well, maybe if you leave them full at the security, the they might drink them. Yeah. Then it's not a waste. No. One day in security people can have my drinks. <laughs> Uh, Rob Fowler on Twitter says, can you explain how drug testing works at the Paralympics? Just the same as at the Olympics, isn't it? It does, and I, I was reading an article in the paper the other day to say that uh, unfortunately we don't have as, as much money to, to test um, as much as we'd like. We have a lot more events here, uh, so it's very difficult to test every medalist. Uh, but they're doing the best that they can. Uh, I'll just from speaking from my own experience, when I won gold, um, as soon as you finish, well, actually, if these guys are being tested, their chaperones are probably waiting for them in the tunnel and they're watching every move. So as soon as you finish your race, they say you've got a drug test and they won't leave your side until you've produced a sample. So I'm sure there is chaperones who will do their test for these guys, waiting for them. After the ceremony. And sometimes it takes a while, doesn't it? Because you can get a bit dehydrated. Yeah, well, you're not going to kind of uh, drink enough to say, you know what, when I finish my race, just in case I need to have a drug test, I'll be ready to go just for them. Particularly after 100 metres, you're nervous. You, you go to the toilet about 10 times before your race because of nerves. And uh, so sometimes they'll be there for three or four hours with you. They will stay there till midnight, two o'clock in the morning, if that's what it takes. You run the water. You drink, so, but you can't drink too much because then you might dilute your urine. So it's, a, <laughs> it's actually like a competing in an event, really. OK, enough information, <laughs> Katrina, about that now, thank you. Very enjoyable. And Let's have the girls, Kenyan anthem. As is customary, <laughs> will those who are able please stand for the national anthem of Kenya? And another wonderful victory ceremony for the men's 1500 metre T46 class. A big bite of the medal for the photos. It isn't chocolate as we talked about the other night. It's not chocolate, no. It's, uh, they're actually silver. The gold medals are made of silver just with a bit, gold of, plating. bit of gold on the outside. That's right. Uh, Philippe Carvalho says, Katrina, can you pair up with Jeremy in four years' time? Well, we'll have to uh, check with my wife. But uh, <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm up for it. Uh, Melinda Marie Morgan says, Jeremy, I love the commentary. You had much enjoyment. Thanks for explaining the different categories, uh, Katrina. 
Philippe Happy, says yeah. Philippe says the Rio Paralympics are going to be amazing to watch. Katrina says we're watching the games from Cape Town and we've been looking at the crowd. You're right, there are no empty seats. Keep up the great commentating. The attendances have been fantastic, haven't they? At all. Well, I had some friends come from um, other countries and past games. You normally could buy tickets. So they didn't buy tickets, and we couldn't actually get tickets for the athletics. This is the first time there was not one ticket available, which is incredible. Mm. And, and the great Brits are just there genuinely. You can just feel it when you're in that stadium. People really just want to be there to experience what London have done, to experience the energy that's in the stadium. Confirmation there of Azadine Nuri's gold in the men's shot put with a world record as well, 13-10. Uh, Kaidi uh, of Iran and Sibone of France getting the bronze. And for me, the real heroes have been the games makers, the people in the purple and red suits who are just ordinary London volunteers that have given up their time and they're uh, just showing people around and showing them where the trains are and where the toilets are and checking the passes on the way in and doing the accreditation and all the volunteers. I'm getting my... Uh Twitter requests coming through, so if you're listening and you've sent one, Ladies just give me a bit of time to accept it and you'll definitely be one of my friends on F20. Katrina L. Webb, she is on Twitter. I'm Jeremy underscore Nicholas. Uh, Jenna Flowers says, thanks for explaining those categories, Katrina. Darlian says she's uh, really Miguel enjoying the Sagara, coverage. So proud of all the participants. A member of the House of Lords. And Richard Madeira says, Daniel Silva, what a great character. <laughs> he was the, the Brazilian who got the silver. I think we will see some of that Portugal, footage for years to come in Cunha. promotion for the for Rio. Yeah. Uh, they'll have to get that footage and use it in their campaign because that was that was one of my highlights. Yeah, Gabriela, Philippe, uh, all saying how much they enjoyed Daniel Silva. Somebody else uh, listening to us in South Africa who's uh, preparing for exams, Malika Sally, says, Jeremy and Katrina, thanks for keeping us company. <laughs> oh, we have some emotion here. You like the criers, don't you, Jeremy? I do like it when they cry, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I must admit, I do like the criers too. Why not? Go for it. Show your emotion. Representing Croatia, Zolan Talic. My best is when uh, when they try and sing the anthem and then they fill up so much they can't sing it. And then yes. they just completely break down. That's, yes. my, that's my favourite moment. My all-time favourite medal ceremony was Daley Thompson when he won gold for Great Britain. And it was when... Um, it was the Moscow Olympics when lots of the world was boycotting the Great Britain team decided to go, but as a protest against the Russian invasion of Afghanistan, they decided we wouldn't have the national anthem. And Daly stood there and sang the anthem instead of the Olympic anthem. That was my one of my favourite moments in sport. I have had a, a question about how are the levels of classification for the intellectually disabled athletes. I'll explain what I know about after we see the national anthem. It has been a system that they've had to spend a lot of time and energy on since the Sydney Games, because as I mentioned before, we had some people in Sydney that weren't intellectually disabled, they were non-disabled, and uh, were part of the Spanish basketball team, in fact, that won gold. Their gold was taken away, and athletes with intellectual disability were uh, banned or prohibited from competing uh, until they could come up with a more bulletproof, foolproof classification system. stand for the national anthem of Spain.
Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, your Paralympic medalists. I was going to give a bit more of an in-depth explanation about how the intellectually disabled uh, classes, mm. how do they become eligible and uh, I'm just waiting for, the, for my uh, Google information to come up but what I do know is that it's a, um, a report from a psychologist that uh, is a quite an in-depth um, interview that they do and go through a whole series of questions and a psychologist does a, a range of testing um, to, to prove a level of intellectual disability and one of the criteria that's come in this games is that being diagnosed before 18 is one of the criteria. Um, so I'll explain a little bit more about that later but there is no classification within intellectually disabled, they all just compete against each other. So there is no level broken down. It's just you've got to meet this uh, minimal level of criteria. And once you do that, you compete in the T20 class. Good explanation. And at this Games, we're seeing intellectual disabled athletes not only compete in athletics, but also in swimming and in table tennis. So only three sports. Gabby Verkowitz says, uh, I live in South Africa. My sister's become obsessed with the Chinese anthem. Because we keep hearing it too much. Keep hearing it. <laughs> There's uh, Wang of China in the discus 36.34. So just to remind you, you're listening and watching the London 2012 Paralympic Games live from the Olympic Stadium on a beautiful evening here in London with me, Jeremy Nicholas, and Katrina Webb is my expert summariser. We've still got a couple of events on the track to go. Uh, we've got the 4x100 uh, metre women's relay for the cerebral palsy class, T35 to T38. Uh, this is the first time we've had this at the Paralympic Games and in fact I was very tempted to maybe have a comeback to run in this, uh, in this, this relay. Really, were you? Yeah, not really, but uh, I did consider it for a couple of seconds. <laughs> but um, no, because we never had a relay throughout my career as an athlete, so it's exciting to have a relay um, and we've got six countries lining up for that. But we've also got a highlight of tonight. We have uh, the men's 1500 T54 final scheduled for... 942. Uh, you'll see names that you're very familiar with, I'm sure. Marcel Hoog, Kurt Fernley, Josh Cassidy, David Weir, just to name a few. So this will be, I say, the, mm. the race of the night. I would think so. Marcel Hoog, the uh, world record holder for uh, Switzerland. David Weir, very much the local favourite, won uh, the other night at the end of the coverage. Uh, the longer race, 5,000 metres. This is the 1,500. There's the runners and riders. Let's have a look at that now then. Marcel Hoog from Switzerland. Kurt Fernley from Australia. Josh Cashley of Canada. David Weir of Great Britain. It's uh, Zhang of China. Lu of China. And, uh, well, there's two Lu's. Lu Chengming and Lu Yang. And then Konjen of Thailand and Waharam who, uh, of Thailand as well, who was uh, very good the other night. But the season's best, uh, fastest time, Marcel Hoog, and he'll be the man to watch. Now, that's what I call a helmet. That is a helmet. We saw a chap with a, a baseball cap on backwards that's earlier, right. but that's a, that's a proper helmet. So over the shorter distances, they don't need to require a helmet, but because of the paces these guys get to, uh, over the 1,500 metres, they'll be moving. And uh, we've seen in previous games, crashes. There is the man, David Weir. He took out the 5,000 metre gold medal the other night where I nearly lost my voice. And I think the crowd moved me about a metre, just with the energy when you're in that stadium hearing that roar. Two Chinese, three Chinese athletes. And what about Fernley, the Aussie? What do we know about him? Fernley is going for any chance of a medal here. He is, uh, he, he has to be my favourite athlete, I, I will tell you. I'm a big fan of Kurt Fernley. He's a good competitor. He'll be going for gold, but he's got the hometown man of David Weir, Marcel Hoog. Mm. This will be tactical. That first few laps will be about getting in the right position. Here okay. they go. I'm, I'm going to predict Hoog wins it, Fernley of Australia second, Weir of Great Britain third. That's my prediction. Okay, I'm going to go. I'm going to go Fernley. I'm going to go with the Aussies. Oh, don't be and silly. I'm going to put. I'm going to put Weir second. So we'll see what happens. 
he's firmly going to get it. So this is three and three-quarter laps of the track, so we're having a little bit of trouble there with Katrina's microphone. I think there's a loose connection. Just keep wiggling and it'll come back on. Well, I'll just keep commentating. We're just, just trying to get Katrina's mic back up. So it's Liu of China in the lead. And of course, it's a very, very canny race. Just getting a new mic uh, sorted out for Katrina. Sorry to not be able to keep you informed with what's happening, but we're uh, back on now and we'll get Katrina back in action. David Weir of Great Britain, though, tracking the Chinese athlete. They've got two laps to go. It's the 1500 metres T54 final. It's Liu Yang of China in the lead. David Weir just behind him. And it's the Canadian up there as well, Josh Cassidy. Are you back with us, Katrina? Am I back? Yeah, yes, here I am. I'm so go. sorry. That's we just right. had a technical glitch with my with my microphone. But again, you can just see a lot of positional changing happening here. They're trying not to lead out the front. They don't want to expend too much energy until they really need to. It's such a tactical race, this one. Kurt Fernley sitting at the back. He is in. Uh, he doesn't. You don't want to get boxed in. One in, one back is a good position. But uh, you can see if Kurt stayed in that position. He will be very difficult to get out. Last lap, we hear the bell. And it's still anybody's race. Josh Cassidy of Canada and David Weir of Great Britain. It's Weir in pole position now. David Weir in pole position, just pulling away from the pack. And it's having that energy of that crowd, I don't think he'll be going anywhere. So it's David Weir. Waharam from Thailand tucked in behind him. And then it's uh, Josh Cassidy from Canada. And uh, Marcel Hoog, you can't rule him out, he's in fourth spot at the moment. But David Weir of Great Britain in the lead and the home crowd rising to their man. It's got Waharam of Thailand behind him. But David Weir still going, Josh Kennedy, uh, uh, Josh Cassidy of Canada, but David Weir's going to get it. Can he hold Whoa. on? He can. David Weir of Great Britain wins it. And the home crowd <laughs> love that. <laughs> Look at that, oh. David Weir, he's a double gold medalist. He won the 5,000 the other night. Yes. And uh, we thought that Fernley might be in with a shout, and Marcel who, and we saw Josh Cassidy of Canada coming <laughs> in well, but confirmation that the home crowd, boy, and forgive me if I'm excited, but I'm a very proud Brit. <laughs> There's Prince Edward, David Weir, 3-12-09. Weir Army, it says on the Union Jack. Oh, and he's, uh, he's an emotional he's man. Crying, as you would be, a perfect race perfect race from David Weir unbelievable and you know people have asked me is there something real about home crown advantage and if that's not a, a demonstration of it get to that front position tactically get yourself in the right position and we know how fast he is he was the gold medalist of this event in Beijing he knows how to win and to do it with the pressure of his own country he's a double gold medalist very familiar name um, in this country because people are saying that you know the Paralympic Games only come around every four years, but uh, in London every year we have the London Marathon, and the first event off is always the wheelchair athletes. And David Weir has consistently won that London Marathon, so he's a name that we every April, one Sunday morning, you'll get up. And uh, I used to actually live on the marathon course in Docklands, and we always used to, well, we had to go out and sort of wave. We, we couldn't get out of the house until the afternoon because we were boxed in. And we used to go out and wave, and David Weir always got a fantastic cheer when he came through Docklands. Well done, fella. Very popular gold medal winner, David Weir of Great Britain, 33 years of age. And at this point, I did think that Waharam of uh, Thailand may well come past him. And uh, Cassidy as well. The Canada at one point was looking uh, very good. But uh, confirmation as he goes over the line that David Weir is the winner. Last lap in 44.84 that is unbelievable time 44.84 it's 
So these guys are absolutely moving. So Weir gets the gold, Waharam of Thailand gets the silver, Kim of Korea gets the bronze. And Marcel Hoog, uh, he sort of looked around about the 400 metre mark to go that he might do something, but he just didn't quite have it. We just didn't call that very well, did we? You said Hoog and I said Fernley and and uh, here's Fernley finishing at the back. And I, I suppose if you're watching that, if you don't get in the right position as Fernley wasn't in that race, there was no chance for him. I saw him trying to think, can I come around in the third or fourth lane to come through and have a sprint? But extra pushing, the extra width it creates, and with someone like David Weir, who's got the speed experience, I think uh, someone like Fernley thought, I don't even get a chance at this. So the stadium really has come to life. I hope you're picking up the noise on your TVs and computers across the world. Well, our TV is shaking here. I think uh, we're in the International Broadcasting <laughs> Centre, uh, which is just on the edge of the park. And uh, I tell you, that noise is moving some ground. It is. Uh, Jenny on Twitter says, I wish able-bodied athletes smiled as much as our disabled athletes. I find myself smiling after each event and each medal ceremony. That's nice. So this is Jonathan de Souza Santos in the discus. Brian says we've missed oh, you, Katrina. Sorry, Brian. I got a brand new microphone, so I'm not going anywhere. And Judith says, Jeremy, your predictions are always incorrect. <laughs> oh, thank, thank you very much. Oh. Uh, Paul Alley says, Jeremy, who is the stadium announcer? His voice sounds familiar. I can't remember what his name is, but I think he's the BBC's athletics guy. Um, I can't remember what his name is. Paul says, Katrina, we miss you already. And Sarah Phipps says, David Weir to win. Woo-woo. So that was a great race. 40.49. <coughs> My voice is nearly broken. 40.49. Uh, <laughs> For the Brazilian yes. there. Now, for, for our viewers and listeners, Ger this is Jeremy's first Paralympic experience, and uh, you can see his experience um, as a commentator is uh, amazing. But you are doing an incredible job to be calling us a, a sport that you've never seen before. And, and even as athletes, it is difficult for us because we don't have events that happen every year that we get to see our competitors. And I can remember rocking up at races going, gee, I've never seen that person before. And as the sport develops, people come out of the woodwork and we've got great talent search programs. And it is really difficult, even when you know the sport, to be able to make predictions. Mm. Uh, so we're, we're trying our best. And if anyone wants to put any predictions through the tweets, we will read them out for you. Now, Friday is National Casual Day in South Africa, raising money for people with disabilities, and Maidy Kalitz is preparing her costume uh, and enjoying the Paralympics. Wonder what the costume will be. So, the stadium has finally settled down after all the excitement of David Weir. And that looked like a fabulous throw there in the discus from the Polish athlete. It's gone incredibly high. Let me just give you a bit of background. F40, we're looking at uh, uh, short stature or dwarf dwarfism, as you can see. This is a class of their own. Well, that's the trouble. When you, just when you start talking about the discus, the camera whips away and we're back on the track. Yes. But that's the good thing about athletics. And uh, when, when I've been in the stadium just watching as a spectator, it is fun because there's always something to look at, whether it's a throwing event, a jumping event, or something on the track. I do feel sorry for the field uh, athletes, though, sometimes that the track ones get all the attention, particularly with the TV coverage. And we can only commentate on the pictures we're being given here. And uh, just when we want to tell you about it, the discus, suddenly they're back on the track. Well, we, we probably can tell you. Well, no, the, the lineup. We'll, we'll, once this race is finished, we'll go back and tell you how the discus is going anyway. So you can um, multitask because you're a woman, but I can only do one thing at once. <laughs> this is the women's 4x1 relay, T35 to 38. So we've got a range of cerebral palsy athletes in here. Uh, you will see different athletes with different levels of cerebral palsy run at different legs. So uh, you, some of the faster ones may be at the last leg. Some of the f slower ones may be first. So this one might be interesting to call because the staggers will be broken differently based on their level of cerebral palsy. This will be the team that I will predict will win. 
Ukraine. The, the Ukrainian team. And they're going to be in lane three. Nobody in lane two. Rus but Russians in lane four. Watch out for the Russians. It's the Aussies in five. The Aussies in five. You, and, could, you uh, could have been in this. Yes, this is my classification. So I'm a T38. I have, have a very mild case of cerebral palsy on my right side, which is you, you're better off having cerebral palsy on your left side because then your right arm could be a strong arm to drive. So I was a little bit more disadvantaged in that. Because, oh, I see, because of the, running, tr the track, that's, because that's the track right. always goes uh, anti-clockwise. That's why right. I've often wondered why. Well, I asked them to turn it the other way, but they yeah. just didn't listen to me. Why don't we run <laughs> clockwise? And there's the uh, great British team, Olivia Breen, Bethany Woodward, and uh, Katrina Hart and Jenny McLaughlin. And Olivia Breen, just 16 years of age, still got her braces on, and uh, she's going to be running the opening leg. So it's Ukraine in three, Russia in four, the Aussies in five, hometown Great Britain in six, China in seven, and Germany in eight. I will say Ukraine, Russia and China will be in the medals. I'll just be happy if Britain get round without <laughs> dropping the baton. <laughs> because as a country, there's, there's one thing that we always do in relays, we always drop the baton or go too far out of you know the zone where you have to hand over the baton. And uh, Well, this will be really important for, for girls with cerebral palsy. I know they've been training hard with their changes, so let's hope that each country gets a good, clear change. So I'll just run through the lanes again. Lane three is the uh, inside lane with the Ukraine, then Russia in four, Aussies in five, Britain in six, China in seven, Germany in the outside, lane eight. It's for runners with cerebral palsy, T35 up to T38. And this is the one that Katrina Webb <coughs> would be in if she hadn't given up the sport to become a commentator and socialite. <laughs> and off they go, and going very well indeed. China in lane seven. China going really well, the Germans are going backwards. China leading it out. China are the first to exchange. Also going well are Australia. Great Britain tracking well as well. It's all one in lanes, of course, though. Great Britain catching the Chinese. The Aussies going very well indeed. The Russians and the Ukrainians on the inside. And it's think, a very uh, poor handover from the Chinese, and the Britons are flying. The, they are flying, and I think Australia might have just been DQ'd then. I just saw one of our athletes stepping out of the lane. We'll look for that result at the end. Last but, changeover. What have we got? The Great Brits are flying, they're using that... Oh, can they get the change? Oh, did Great Britain hand over in time? I don't think they did, and the Russians are going to come storming through. The Aussies, we think, are disqualified, and Britain, I think, are going to be disqualified as well. And look at that Chinese Chin runner, where she come from? She's flying! And that's the makeup of the different disability groups, so they might have had a 38 running last. So depending on where they stage their team, this will be an interesting race. I'm not sure whether we're going to have a couple of DQs, so we're just going to have to wait. Well, the Russian girl doesn't look very happy, so were, were their chain of changeovers all legal? She looks a bit worried. No, she's smiling now, so I think Russia have got it. Uh, China obviously had a, a T38 running the last yes. leg, the least disabled of all, I would say, because she came absolutely storming through. Britain, I think, on the handover from three to four, went beyond the yellow line where you have to hand over, yes. so I think they're going to be disqualified. The Aussies, you thought, went out of a lane, so they could be disqualified. It could be carnage. It could be carnage. Which is a shame. And I did say that as a nation, we are terrible at passing the buttons. I think we're control freaks. We don't like, no, it's my button. You're not having it. And the Russians have certainly won the gold. And we're still waiting for the official results here because I think they'll be having to check maybe the footage to see whether athletes did run out of their lanes. Absolutely. First time this relay has been run at Paralympic level. Here we go, watching Katie Parrish here as she. Oh no, it was on when she first came out. She's when she's handing over there. I didn't see the Ukrainian. She fell. The Ukrainian girl fell very heavily. I hope she's A okay. A race full of dramas. It was an extraordinary race, wasn't it? Russian powering through. I think the Russians are the only team that uh, have had successful changes and uh, got through with a perfect race. The pressure of competing. How were you on baton changes when you were running? No, we never had relays when I was running. Never had so, the relay. So uh, never had to experience this. It hadn't been invented. No, they hadn't been invented. <laughs> <laughs> That's how long ago you were running. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. No, look, we don't see many relays in the, the Paralympic Games, but we will, we will as, as we get more and more athletes involved, particularly from other areas I've talked about from developing countries. 
This is a good example of all the countries that have got great Paralympic programs in place. I really hope that Ukrainian girl is okay. She had a, quite a strong fall there at the back of the screen. We're still waiting for these results. But uh, I think we can say that the Russians have got it, but the Chinese girl came absolutely storming through there. And with Great Britain, if they're not DQ'd, picking up the bronze medal. We'll get back to you when we can. Maybe we can go back and uh, give some of the, the discus updates. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we now have the victory ceremony for the men's T36 400 metres. Christine Bennett's enjoying our coverage out in Jamaica. And also someone from Germany I just Medals saw coming through. Will be presented by Mr. Sonny Wang, Scout Jaeger. Nice broadcast enjoying this here in, in Germany. Of Samsung, Mr. Sonny Wang, fantastic Ms. name. Kate Howie, from Samsung. MP, former British sports minister. Will they, will they cheer good for her if she's a former sports minister? They do. They like the former ones. Uh, yeah, because Kate Howie, she was in the Olympics. The she was uh, so if you're in the Olympics Roman and you become Hamlet. a politician, it's okay. Yeah, like Sebastian Coe. Yes, yeah. okay. We love, we love Sebastian Coe, don't we? Yes. Kate Howe, I think she was a javelin thrower or a pentathlete or something before the heptathlete. So maybe I should go into politics in Australia. I might have some followers. You could seeing do. Seeing I've been successful in. I do know Kate Howe. I know it's, you like to drop names. I know Kate Howe, uh, MP. I'm, probably one of my most embarrassing moments as a radio reporter so it was a feature on the Oxford and Cambridge boat race and she was the Minister of Sport at the time and I was interviewing her on the terraces of the Houses of Parliament by the river and just at the end of the thing I said and is this where you'll be watching the race as it goes by and, and she said no because it's between Putney and Mortlake it doesn't come this far up <laughs> and I said Kate Hoey thanks for joining us <laughs> oh no <laughs> it, it, the interview had gone so well and I, just a last question I just saying, and will you be watching it from here just a throwaway thing no, because it doesn't come up this far. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kate Hoey. Back to the studio. <laughs> uh, whoops. <laughs> oh, well. Here we go. Silver medals. There is Kate Hoey. Lovely Irish accent. No, I won't be because it doesn't come up this far. <laughs> I saw someone throw their flowers out to the crowd today. Lovely yes. gesture. Oh, that's good. The gold medalist and Paralympic champion representing the Russian Federation, Evgenia Shvetkov. And there's Shvetkov. He ran a fantastic race. Strength right to the line. <laughs> so we can hear the Russian anthem again. Someone asking, what is it that I like about them crying? I just think it shows the passion. If they cry during the anthem, it shows they love the country, they're proud to be there, and they've... Uh, They've fulfilled their dream. That's why I like the crime. Nothing, nothing more sinister than that. Gives Kate Hoey a kiss. Doesn't ask her a silly question like I did. And I think as an athlete, it's not just you Ladies on this guys. It's your team of people that have supported you. And when you get quite emotional, it is because you're thinking about everyone that's helped. Absolutely. That's the Russian anthem, and Ladies we've seen and the last girls, track event of the night, the cerebral palsy runners in the, uh, in the relay. Still want to see if I can get some results for that relay. We'll just have a look at our system here, and uh, 
Still no results. OK, well, we have to sign off, unfortunately, on the uh, international feed. It's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure working with you. Pleasure. pleasure. It's been a lot of it's pressure. A, <laughs> a lot of pressure and some pleasure. Uh, Katrina Webb, thank you very much uh, for joining us here on uh, Paralympic Sport TV. We've got some wheelchair basketball coming up for you on this channel, so stay with us for that. Uh, for those on the web, we're going to carry on with the last little bits of athletics. Goodbye to everyone across the world. Lekker slap. Ladies and gentlemen, the victory ceremony for the women's 400 meters T12. The medals will be presented by Mr. Valery Suchkovich, member of the Paralympic Order, who is accompanied by Ms. Kate Hoey, MP, former British Sports Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, the bronze medalist representing Mexico, Gianna, Daniela Velasco Maldonado, and her guide runner, Jose Guadalupe Fuentes Ortiz. silver medalist representing Ukraine, Oksana Bortochuk.
please stand for the national anthem of France. Thank you. 